Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to the CSI International Convention Centre. My name is Bronwyn Cadel de Pont, and I'm welcoming you here today on um, behalf of the Science Diplomacy Capital for Africa. This is a legacy event leading on from the World Science Forum, which took place in December last year. Um, it's the first of a number of legacy events that we're going to be holding in order to ensure that the Declaration on Science for Social Justice is actually put into action and that, and that um, everything that was discussed at the World Science Forum last year actually becomes a reality and is filtered down, of course, um, to assist the citizens of our country, our continent, and hopefully even the rest of the world. So thank you for all uh, giving your time this morning. Our program director, Aidan, has uh, rightly said that this might be the most boring part of the program, but for me, uh, or the most uh, hard work part of the program of our two days, but for me, it's the most important part. So thank you once again for being here. Just on behalf of the uh, CSR International Convention Center, I would like to say um, in the event of an emergency, we're not going to do a full emergency briefing today because of time, but in the event of an emergency, there are trained responders that will direct you out of the building, out of the nearest um, emergency exit. However, of course, uh, that has not happened in the past and we trust it's not going to happen in the future. And we'd like to thank Mr. Aylin Gilligan from ScienceCom for facilitating and conceptualizing this event that you're here to participate in today or this work I don't want to call it a workshop or a work stream, but this very important work that you're going to be doing today. So, Aidan, if you're ready, I'll hand over to you. If everyone has got a copy of the declaration with them, um, please feel free to hand in any notes on, the, on those papers afterwards, um, if you feel they might not have been captured um, sufficiently to your liking. And with no further ado then, I will... Um, introduce Mr. Aidan Gilligan from ScienceCom, and uh, he will introduce the rest of our speakers and moderators that we have online from around the world. So thank you, Aidan, and welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, I know most of you, but I think that I thought Irish names were difficult until I first started coming to South Africa, so apologies if I get names wrong going forward. Uh, my name is Aidan Gilligan. I'm Irish, as you can hear, but I live and work in Brussels, Belgium, and I have a, an office for social justice in Brussels and one in Cape Town. So I just want to guide some of you who have never been involved in this process since 2012 through the backstory a little, and I want to introduce you to some of the text that has been submitted from our drafting committees who are not here. Um, one of the obstacles with not having funding and being a completely free, bottom-up, grassroots movement is we don't have the luxury of grants and we've relied always on the help of partners for hosting us and so on. So some of the key players are actually not here. Because of the heat wave in Europe, most flights were cancelled. So today I'm stepping in for David Buds peterson from Copenhagen and Sean Shelley from Cape Town. And what we propose to do is I will just guide you through some of the key texts that came in in December from our meeting. We had it in Cape Town and from the global partners involved in the drafting. As many of you know, words matter and we have an Indaba culture here, but today is more about being a do shop than a talk shop, and words do matter. For example, if I held a conference here today called Exploding Myths About GMOs, Nuclear Research, and Tobacco, it's a different conference if I say Exploding Myths About Nuclear Research and Tobacco. So what we're looking for is your insights from your anecdotes, your careers, your backgrounds. And today is kind of Chatham House Rules, um, there are people listening and watching us online who are involved in the process. So don't be shy in putting forward afterwards comments or opinions to texts that you might want to see adapted if you don't want to talk in the room today. So just to acknowledge um, the background is that in 2012 we had a very different world. Um, social media didn't really exist. iPhones barely existed if you think about it. And I was working in the European Commission for 10 years in crisis communications for the in-house science services. So I was the press officer for the Fukushima or the Asian tsunami, um, lots of debates on food problems, BSE and stuff like that. 
But I kind of realized with my career that marginalization was institutionalized. And I felt that I was presenting panels on brain research and uh, nuclear reactors and stuff without having any background in science, but just reading out a speech for a minister or a commissioner and so on. So I had the idea in 2012 to create a kind of safe meeting space where we would look at the ethics and principles of science policy making. Because as a spokesperson at the European Commission and a press officer, half of my job was actually hiding things from the public, covering up in a good sense, not to have panics and so on. So what we did was we got a group of 27 people together in Brussels in 2012. And Brussels, as you know, is the capital of NATO, but mostly the capital of the EU. And you can't do anything in the town without getting it authorized from the council, the parliament, or the commission. So how we got around that was, by accident, I met this fantastic guy called Dan de Tway, who was the science councillor of South Africa to the EU. And he said, sure, you can use our mission. You can use the embassy of South Africa. And through the mission, we were able to invite in people like Dame Anne Glover, who was the first ever science advisor to the EU. We were able to invite in people from Africa, people from Asia, not the usual suspects. So we had a two-day meeting, a brainstorming, about what was wrong with the global commons on science. And at that meeting, we came up with 15 principles. And the meeting was co-chaired by the then Irish science advisor and the European Commission science advisor. Although she was technically banned from attending the meeting by the Commission President, and they sent two director generals from other ministries to watch her and take notes on what she would say. So from the beginning, we had a very difficult birth. But we realized that we were touching into something very important. We were looking at the kind of challenge to top-down knowledge coming from science and um, this kind of scholar's approach vis-a-vis -vis what citizens need on the ground. So what happened was we had people for like Julian Kindelera, South African, who at that time was president of the European Group on Ethics, of the European Commission. We had uh, Michelle Kazachkin, who's been the key motor of this for the past decade, who was the UN Health Envoy. Now think about this for a second. At that stage in 2012, the UN Health Envoy for HIV AIDS was banned from having any meetings with the European institutions. Why? Because Ban Ki-moon had created the post because the European Commission refused to acknowledge the HIV epidemic in Central and Eastern Europe, where we had 11 former USSR states joining the EU. And because we needed referenda to have the enlargement, we didn't want the publics in the old 15 countries to think they might be letting in HIV people. So you can see this kind of logic. So we were attracting people from outside the system who would challenge the system. And there's too many to mention, but um, people like uh, Michael Mann in Cape Town, we have Olive here, we have Solly, we have Himla, who has been amazing over the past five years in offering venues and so on. We have um, uh, Dan de Troyes, as I said, and Francois here, who's been on several panels. So I just want to tee it off is that we started just looking and scratching at this world of top-down certainty versus bottom-up needs. Um, at that time, we had the first smoking bans in the world. We were having issues around alcohol, drug dependency, and so on. So we took as a concept the idea of harm reduction science because we felt that it was the most difficult thing to look at where the policies were so bad worldwide. For example, in 2012, think about this. Um, you had the French president banning GMOs even though other countries said it's okay. You had the Irish government banning smoking in public spaces, even though the French government said they would never ban it in French cafes and so on. So we were looking at the same evidence coming from all over the world, meeting in the same committees, but nobody shouting out when bad decisions were made. So on the first meeting, we invited in the three chairmen, individual chairpersons of the EU's health bodies, which are basically independent panels appointed by the Commission to look at issues. Now, I had worked in one of those panels looking at plastics, for example. And what happened was the Germans were very upset because Mattel was losing Christmas to the Chinese around 2012. So we had to find a way to ban plastic from China. So we set up a committee under um, the British commissioner at the time, uh, Mandelson, to look at the problem of nanoparticles in Chinese plastics. So then we could ban all the shoes coming in from China as well, and this was great. But what we would do was we would have a panel of 15 experts, doctors, um, chemists, and so on. But we would always take the report and fiddle it towards what we wanted, using the idea that because of language, there would be an English-speaking rapporteur in the room, which would be me. 
and whatever was said, we would doctor it. So, for example, the same plastic was in hip replacements, in breast implants, and so on, but we didn't ban them. So I was working at this all the time, and I said, there's something wrong. It doesn't really add up. So let's explore it a little bit. So what we did was um, we decided to hold a meeting once a year, a high-level consultation event like this, and what we would do is we would hold maybe six or ten sub-meetings a year all over the world. So we would tap into everyone. So let me fast forward then what happened was we brought in the Americans to look at brain reward systems around addictions for one event. We looked at gambling and all these things. Um, one event we looked at a new concept called institutionalized manslaughter and that got very, it was a lot of press and everybody was upset. So what we did was we said, look, if I'm in Coca-Cola in 1980 and I put the wrong chemicals, into coke. And it's found out that my scientists knew about it in 2023. I go to jail. Clear. If a policymaker is given good evidence to do X, Y, and Z and doesn't do it, the policymaker never goes to jail. The taxpayers pay a compensation fund to the people afterwards, but the actual politician or the advisory group never get their day in court. So we call this concept institutionalized manslaughter and it got everybody really upset. So what we would do is we'd pick 20 or 30 thought leaders from around the world to write independent pieces. So we would match them. So I'll give you an example. The head of Action on Smoking and Health, the world's biggest charity, anti-smoking, um, Martin Dockrell, Deborah Arnott from the UK, we got them to co-write a piece with the head of scientific research at British American Tobacco. Similarly, we got the biggest anti-alcohol lobby scientist to write a piece with the people working for Spirits Europe and so on. So we're constantly making these clashes happen. So what happened was we got a lot of wind behind us. We got a lot of people trying to take down the meetings and we held panels everywhere. We held panels at the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. We, heard, we had, had panels in Korea, in Japan, all over Europe. And what we would do is we would tie it to the European City of Science meeting every two years and bring the science advisors together. So we had these meetings going, and in 2017, we finished with a meeting. If you've, if you've looked at the program, you'll see the links to all these pictures and, science and sessions. So if you, if you want to go back and look at everybody that's involved, it's all open on the site. But um, we held a town hall meeting at Manchester Town Hall in 2017 with 92 science advisors mostly. And they'd never been brought together before, the Japanese, the EU, and people like this. And what was unique was the science advisors would tell you exactly how it worked in practice, not what they tell the system. So we boiled that down into 20 principles called Ethics and Principles for Science and Society Policymaking. And that was in uh, July 2016. And then what happened was we came to the second science forum South Africa here uh, with the South African Academy. And Himmler was involved in these meetings from the start and some people in the room. And we road tested the principles that were coming out of the white global north into Africa's biggest general science conference here. So we had a few sessions here in that December. And we got so much better knowledge coming from you guys about the difference between what would work in practice and what looked like really good prose. So then what happened was Naledi Pandor asked to join the presentation panel of the Brussels Declaration on science and society policymaking at the AAAS meeting in Boston in February 2017. And we invited as a discussant the then New Zealand science advisor, Sir Peter Gluckman, and we had the three chairmen and women of the process presenting the findings. Now we had working groups like today working on these texts over like six months. And we presented it in the States and there was an immediate kind of negative reaction from the journals. Um, contesting who are these people, what are their qualifications, who has got at them, what industry has got at them, and so on. And um, Naledi gave her, her reaction to the text as a policymaker. And in the first week, we had three million downloads, right? And then what happened was universities start using it as a teaching tool. For example, David Woods Peterson, who's going to speak next, um, his academy in Denmark used it for compulsory training for the doctors, for example. Wilson Compton, for example, the deputy director of NIH, used it to impose compulsory training for all doctors in America on addictions training, which didn't exist before, and so on and so forth. So what happened was after that conference, we were all exhausted and kind of tired of it, to be honest. But Naledi Pandor said, could you do a process for Africa? Would you be able to do something for Africa? But something that is done by Africans for Africans 
and um, written in languages that Africans can read and understand and so on. So we started here, um, we had a kickoff event in Cape Town in June 2017. I think Olive was present, Solly was certainly present and other people. And it was very in Daba and it was more focused, I found, on negativity and problems rather than outcomes. So we quickly shifted it back to, look, we need to come up by 2021 with a good text called the Cape Town Declaration on Science for Social Justice. And then what happened with COVID, in the meantime, South Africa won the title of World Science Forum, and they took the same title as us, Social Justice. So what we did was we agreed with your government that we would um, deliver our text a day or two before the main conference. So then we, here's where it gets a little bit interesting. So we had meetings, about six or 10 panels here at Science Forum South Africa. We had the DG Phil coming over to Toulouse to present on this. We had several members of the South African science establishment coming all over the world to always anchor it. Because without the South African government, other governments wouldn't take it seriously or they'd take it down. That's the truth. So what happened was um, the World Science Forum is the most, I would say, closed elitist event. You think UNESCO is bad, this is a different, different ballgame. So what the South African government did was at the end of the conference in December, they decided to do something unique. They put the declaration out for public consultation, uh, which wasn't appreciated by everybody, but it was great. And I think they got about 100 submissions back in on changing the text before the deadline. And one of the um, changes was that in Article 1 of the declaration, you can read, they put in um, a call for the inclusion of a role for harm reduction sciences, which informs greater empathy for people with addictions. And they asked for the document to be driven by a sense of urgency and a need to address societal harms, we continue to uh, advance our commitment to social justice anchored in people's power. Small words, but it really mattered. So what happened then afterwards was basically Minister Nimzande asked us as a collective, because we'd stopped more or less, to organize this as the first legacy event of the conference. And so today is about codifying that final document that people have been working on. And tomorrow we have a conference on science for social justice where we look in four panels at health systems, the structures of health systems, particularly in Africa. We're looking at people and how people experience public health. We're looking at the latest brain research. I really advise you, if you're not here tomorrow, to watch online. NIH will do a 20-minute presentation of all the breaking research on brain reward systems and their take on addiction being a development problem. To counteract that, the um, chief of um, chemistry and kind of brain research at uh, Johns Hopkins University will do a counter presentation after that, where he will kind of contest this American narrative of drug abuse and everything is to do with your parents and your genes. It's not that simple. So we will have that tomorrow. And then we have a final panel, which is, which is organized by Karisha Abdul Karim. Uh, many of you will not know that Karisha has been appointed by the UN to lead, to be part of a new East and Southern African Global Commission on Drugs Policy, which is quite important, with the former president of Nigeria, the former president of Atlanta of South Africa and so on. So she will talk about that and that panel will look at positive developments happening from the grassroots up across Africa, not top-down stuff particularly from governments. So that's teeing it up a, a little bit. So. Um, our main overriding principle through this whole journey has been that in principle 18 of the first declaration is that scientific must, advice must be involved in all stages of policy making. Sounds so obvious, but it's so not true. If you look today, for example, South Africa has a, a bill going forward, I think on vaping, one month of public consultation. If you look what's happened, um, Australia has banned vaping completely. You need a doctor's letter to vape. Okay? New Zealand has gone the opposite, a bit like the British. Vaping is free on the public health service. So how would you, where are the hands coming up internationally from the doctors saying, how can you have such different diametrically opposed views on the biggest killer on the planet, which is smoking still? So what we try to do is we're going to try and have 20 principles that will advise those kind of arguments, but we don't go down the rabbit holes of topics. So be aware that what we're discussing today with David it's anchored in a kind of revulsion for public lives not really mattering. And basically, I'm coming from the rich city of Brussels, and I know my life is a postcode lottery. Okay. But if you think about this for a second, 
we all were shocked to see the ban on smoking and alcohol in South Africa and police firing rubber bullets at women shopping and stuff like that. But there wasn't much apathy in the country, right? But at the same time, um, you know, five people go, on, go down in a sub and we spent $3 million looking for them and 750 black people drowned in the Mediterranean last month and we don't even look for the bodies. We're so immune to this. But what we, do, what we are looking at is where is the accountability in the science advisory system? Who are the experts? How are they appointed? How are they held to account? Where can the bottom grassroots groups feed in? So we've always involved the third sectors quite well. We've always been conscious of challenging the charities, uh, where the money comes from, which charities are owned by governments, which charities are not. Uh, I see in my hotel today you have the BBC World Service, but how many people know that it's 100% financed by the Foreign, Foreign Commonwealth Office? Um, the $8 billion that was given to Médecins Sans Frontières for uh, Ebola research, where did it go? Things like that. So we bring in their scientific leadership a lot and we engage. So we have a no-ban culture, which is important. Um, so what I'll jump into right now is the actual document that was produced in December. This is the draft one. And each of you has in front of you the one that has been now revised by the UN Health Envoy. And I'm just going to point out a few small things, and then David will take over sector by sector, and then we want to hear your inputs from the floor. Everyone has a microphone, and I have a microphone as well, and there's no questions, who's stupid, no comment, nothing like that. So you will see the history of this 11-year movement. Um, you will see the involvement, strong involvement of pan-African culture and society in this from the very beginning. I want to stress again that Africa has been involved since 2012, not just 2017 when we switched to a Cape Town topic. Um, it's all about the politics of hope and about injustice and inequalities. But what the working groups came up with was just a few calls that I think are quite important to get you thinking. So what the text given to me by the working groups is we call for a new orientation of science to be transformative, driven by the common good, equitable human development within planetary boundaries, and to be solutions focused and planned for the ethical application of knowledge. We call for a new attitude or ethos in science to become more inclusive and collaborative, integrative of diverse sources of knowledge, open and accessible to all. We call for the reorganization of science systems towards greater global connectivity, collaboration, and a genuine integration across different parts of the world, while retaining necessary adaptable structures for social impacts in different social contexts. The, what I remember from December was, think about this fact, 55 countries in Africa, COVID hits. 16 countries had ventilators. 11 countries had hand pump ventilators. So where's the money going? So these are the kinds of things that enumerate these anecdotes for these kinds of principles. So this manifesto of ideas and recommendations stem from a decade-long, high-level and purposefully low-level consultation process involving dozens of meetings and thousands of individuals from civil and what we like to call uncivil society alike. We are committed to do everything within our power and areas of influence to promote, defend and stand up for vulnerable groups. We will not simply accept the liquidation of hard-won democratic principles and freedoms in the name of politics as usual. We call upon all stakeholders, governments, scientists, activists, media, industry and the public at large to cooperate in a joint effort to ensure the just application of evidence-based policy making and community-focused interventions for the benefit of society as a whole. We will work to fight for greater inclusiveness, participation and accountability in science and to stand up and be counted when we find that this is not the case. We will work to end gross misconduct and marginalization via the sharing of science's benefits and the global public goods it can and must provide for all citizens of our planet, regardless of race, nationality, class, gender, sex or age. So you've all heard this before. You hear this in every declaration. But in our principles, we would back them up with anecdotes and real life case studies. So that's what you have to help feed in for us today. So um, just to jump down, what we had said was achieving this both requires a clear-eyed recognition of the current unequal state of scientific access across the world and similarly 
unequal historical contributions towards science. A global campaign aiming to root out injustice and inequity and emphasizing the attainment of greater social justice must acknowledge that progress cannot be measured only by temperature or life expectancy targets. Concepts of human dignity and autonomy and responsibility within society matter too. How do we differentiate between the responsibilities of indiv individuals to look after themselves with an ever more complex social structure and the responsibilities of states to look after their citizens, to provide security and a milieu in which to live a satisfying life? Recognition of the centrality of social justice means that the reduction of inequality between and among peoples must be consistent with the achievement of fixed social justice policy goals. Societies worldwide both profess intolerance for the existence of injustices and inequalities, but by their very nature provide the social and legal settings to enable and make legitimate their use. Since the launch of the current consultative process in 2017, our framework recognises that the work of social justice permeates all of society and all of science. Social justice is core to these practices and it is not something that we can be allowed to separate from science. So David will take you through a little bit more the academic approach, um, what's coming out of the academics in our panels and so on. Um, but the most important message we got through this is that you are all scientists, for example, and you believe that so social, let's say, engagement, you do it, but you don't think about it. You think social engagement is just getting peer review and your articles published. For us, it's completely the opposite. It's getting the views of the people at the other end of the application of that science. So that's what we're trying to square with this kind of declaration. So what we have said, and this is what gets us in trouble with the, with the policymakers, that we believe that science is relevant to politics, policy, and power because it is based on evidence and gets it right most of the time. Okay? Um, we then, I jump forward to the questions. So what came up was a, a kind of very obvious system of questions of how you transist, or you, you, you kind of move towards a better world for all without, without being glib, because there's hundreds of declarations like this. So there were a lot of kind of negative people in the meetings too who just thought it couldn't be done. Let's be realistic. Mama knows this. We had these discussions over and over. So there were about six or seven barriers that came up um, that people said that David and Michelle and Julian and Michael and Razigan and all these people, Himla and others, had to acknowledge existed before we could do text that really could get through. So I'll just read you those before I end. So the open-ended questions for you today are, can the conditions for social justice exist if... The salient model is striving for poor societies with a small cohort of extremely rich individuals. If the salient economic model is a continued scramble for natural resources by taking more out in real terms than is going into less developed nations and the implicit bribery and cor corruption that this entails. If the worship culture remains uncontested for all things growth, technology, finance and markets, and continues to be pushed on countries characterized as easily influenced or having weak institutions. If we fail to rebalance back to an emancipatory relationship between humans rooted in respect for history, culture, and indigenous knowledge. Without greater ecocentric living, recognizing the sanctity of all forms of life, our interconnections and ethics and respect and care for others, for animals, and for our shared environment. Without the unleashing power of the science as a solutions-focused enterprise that is both societally accountable and driven by the common good. Without a better alignment between the scale of global challenges and an agreement on what takes priority and what gets funded first. Without a better alignment between the capacities of the global north and the so-called global south to produce scientific knowledge that is better tailored to resolve local national, regional, and global challenges. If global multilateral scientific cooperation excuse me, is the exception rather than the rule and grossly underfunded with extremely competitive national systems and national investments dominating. If this intense competition for limited resources undermines by its very nature the ability for researchers to come together 
and bring a unified focus and solutions-based approach to common challenges facing humanity. And finally, if public awareness of science, public trust in science and public understanding of how science advisory systems work and how they might play a role remains significantly weak. If the science and society compact cannot autocorrect itself and be held to account, if statements on the human rights of science and the importance of open science, the value of citizen science, the need for investment a percentage of GDP remain declaratory and seldom enforced. So that's just a little bit of the background of the brief that was given to David. Now David Woods Peterson is professor of what's called humanomics in the University of Copenhagen. David is a philosopher. And David was um, the youngest guy in the meeting, the first meeting in 2012. He was there on behalf of the Danish government because they were hosting European City of Science in 2014. And since then, David has been very involved. But we're very conscious that today we're two white guys from the Global North talking to a community from the Global South. So apologies for that up front as well. Um, if David is ready to take over, and you want to introduce yourself, David, a bit more in depth. start by sending my apologies for not being able to make it to uh, Pretoria today. I tried quite hard on uh, two different cancelled flights out of uh, Frankfurt, having spent now 48 hours in an airport trying eagerly to um, get uh, to South Africa to join you for this important consultation event. Unfortunately, I was unsuccessful. Uh, and has been now relocated uh, back in Copenhagen where I'm uh, providing some comments and input on the background of the principles in the declaration online. So I hope you will uh, bear with me. Um, it's, it's a real honor and also a, a huge pleasure to be able to, uh, to go into a little bit more details on some of the items Aiden already mentioned. Uh, I would like to start by thanking Aiden for having uh, provided such a comprehensive overview already uh, by now getting uh, us all up to speed and creating a common um, frame of reference. I think that's quite uh, helpful for the, for the conversation this afternoon. Uh, also, Aiden is, of course, the main, also the main author of the uh, document, even though myself and colleagues have now um, over the last uh, month, uh, added our our thoughts and uh, and the thoughts and thinking of, of several other um, stakeholders as well to the document. I will try and share a couple of slides, uh, which I hope you can see. Otherwise, you can. valuable work by our uh, drafting committee. Um, it's only a selected number of, of, uh, of contributors I can, I, I can mention today. Obviously, as Aiden said, many people have been involved already since 2017 and even before that, uh, going back to uh, 2012. Uh, but it's key among them, of course, Michel Kasitsin, uh, uh, the Special Advisor to the World Health Organization and the, its Regional Office for Europe um, uh, in Genova has been tremendously helpful as the mentor and uh, really the expert on, uh, on many of the topics relating to harm reduction and equally in the, in the document. Uh, also, Sean Shelley uh, from South Africa, uh, Anna Tomasi the, uh, from the Global Commission on Drug Policy was on our drafting committee. Uh, myself, um, I'm a professor of uh, science communication and science policy uh, at Aalborg University in Copenhagen. Um, and then, uh, as Aidan already uh, uh, mentioned, which I think is worth emphasizing again, we received a tremendously valuable input from uh, a number of uh, participants at the World Science Forum in December 2022 in Cape Town. Uh, among them, uh, the people Aiden already recognized, Rasigan, Himmler, Raja Pilge, but uh, also many more, including, I'm sure, several of uh, the members of the audience. 
um, this afternoon. So we are really looking at a collaborative and collective effort. Um, it is not a, a document that has been drafted with any particular institutional affiliations um, uh, as the backdrop. It has been a collective uh, process driven and organized mainly by uh, Aiden and uh, by the South African colleagues. Um, the road uh, to the declaration, Aiden already mentioned, uh, I think it's worth again for the sake of establishing a, uh, a common frame of reference, it might be worth just uh, reiterating um, that we are looking at a decade long initiative that is now coming to its end after your consultation workshop today and the input conference tomorrow. So it has been an attempt, you can say, to codify a sort of a blueprint for a new set of uh, ethical guidelines and principles to inform uh, global work at the boundary between science, um, civil and uncivil society and policy making, as Aiden already mentioned. Um, the initiative bridges, as you will also um, uh, uh, as you will also see in the in the written uh, document that has been circulated, it bridges the 2017 launch of the Brussels declarations uh, at the AAAS, which Aiden already mentioned, and then on to the uh, ongoing final uh, work um, with its uh, Pan-African uh, equivalent that we are looking at um, today and uh, tomorrow. Uh, the Brussels Declaration uh, was uh, launched by, by several of the contributors uh, for, the, for the Cape Town Declaration as well. Michelle, uh, Dr. Wilson uh, Compson, who will be speaking uh, tomorrow, uh, were co-chairing uh, the launch in 2017 at the AAAS. Uh, they were joined by uh, Declaration rapporteurs and also discussants, um, chief among those, uh, Naledi Pandor, um, the then uh, Science Minister of South Africa, uh, as Aiden already mentioned. So uh, the document uh, had a quite strong uh, launch and a quite strong reception, both positive and, and less positive, I would, I would say, by the people who might have feel, uh, felt affected by some of our recommendations. Um, it was followed on uh, before. Um, uh, here's just the list, and you can definitely have the slides, those of you who want to to have the the historical account, it was it was a it was a culmination of our, of our decade long consultation event, which I won't one more time mention here. It was uh, being uh, mentioned and also uh, commented upon in in some of the uh, most established uh, and uh, pronounced uh, academic journals in the world. Uh, nature, the Lancet, the Euroscientists, um, in which we had a chance to uh, to sort of bring the declaration to life um, uh, among a, a global audience with, with what I would call a real sort of uh, global uh, impact. So this is the legacy we are following on from uh, with, the, with the mandate that was given to the drafting committee um, by the South African government and administration and the organizers of the World Science Forum uh, last year. Um, in this uh, declaration, we are refocusing on developing a playbook to sort of address the practice, ethics and liability of uh, science for social justice, as Aidan uh, also outlined. Of course, much still needs to be done uh, to challenge the ways in which society uh, view and interact with policymaking and also uh, how policymakers uh, choose uh, to interact and with whom they choose to interact with um, continues to be challenging uh, in the context of social justice. Um, elites uh, tend to form strong homogeneous uh, networks and uh, not always listen to uh, the voice of the marginalized, of the non habits and the and the, the people without strong voices in established discourse. So this is something we are addressing in the declaration and something that really needs to come across as a major agenda item, um, both in South Africa, obviously, but it really, uh, it really accounts for the entire globe. 
Um, so connecting uh, research uh, uh, and policy making obviously is a messy, complex, I call it here, non-linear uh, exercise. It's something that does not uh, trickle down easily um, and it has become uh, more necessary than ever, uh, both in terms of, of harm reduction and real harms uh, that are um, uh, affecting citizens on the ground who do not have access to solutions, diagnostics, medicines, but also evidence, um, as well as uh, it has become necessary for reasons that have to do with the um, with the pandemic, um, with the global uh, acute climate change uh, that really needs to be addressed by a stronger contract uh, between policy and science and society. So there is a there is a, um, a certainly a, a burning uh, platform here. The road to the Cape Town Declaration, um, I would say, um, uh, has to be about delivering some recommendations which can improve the practice of science and informing socially just policies and also uh, the taking of advice by elected officials. So we want to be able to produce recommendations that will um, enhance and guide the taking of advice, uh, both by, by uh, elected officials, uh, from scientists and experts, but also from citizens, um, from uh, third sector institutions, from NGOs, from community organizations as well. And by doing so, we, at least in the drafting committee, believe that we will be promoting greater integrity but also at the same time, greater diversity and greater accountability of science and science advice. Uh, this includes, among other things, ethical approaches to defending uh, basic human dignity um, in the way research is conducted and implemented in society. It, it also necessitates greater stakeholder inclusion Aiden talked about citizen science, but also having broad and um, and uh, trustworthy uh, consultations, citizen uh, engagement, um, and also compassion for people uh, and contributing to well-being and uh, and equally. Um, these are important principles that we need to codify uh, in order to get the, the declaration uh, across and, and for it to have a real uh, impact. So it is all about ethics, it's all about values, but at the same time it's also about the, the infrastructure, uh, the sort of nuts and bolts of getting recommendations across that will actually make a difference. And this is where the audience of today's workshop really can make a major contribution in this final period of the of the drafting process and the consultation process so i'm looking very much forward to the to the discussion and also to your to your input today uh, which will be very much um, valued uh, in the declaration some of you may have read it others might just have been handed it um, uh, today uh, coming to the conference um, I'm sure many of you have a, have a busy schedule and might not have read all the principles in detail. Um, and even though our host uh, now uh, 30 minutes ago warned us that this uh, session uh, might become a little bit boring, um, I still believed and thought um, in consultation with Aiden that it might be a good idea to go through some of the principles um, for consideration in a little bit more detail, so uh, you will have to bear with me. Uh, uh, you will uh, be presented with a couple of slides now with, with some of the principles. And I hope that um, given uh, this sort of uh, comprehensive overview that you all will uh, be better equipped uh, to sort of start head on the conversation about what needs to change as Aiden already encouraged in terms of wording, in terms of uh, topics, topicality, um, but also um, if, 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 if you like to point out uh, weaknesses uh, and, and, and deficits within the current text that would indeed be much appreciated for us uh, authors to move, uh, to move forward. Uh, the first section of the principles is exactly about the science policy nexus, the 
social contract uh, between science and policy. And as you will see in the document that you have in front of us, principle number one um, is about how science uh, should empower uh, global social justice. So really a call for using, utilizing scientific endeavors, scientific efforts to empower global social justice bringing science and an understanding of its complexities into the lives of citizens and promoting literacy and open communication should be taken seriously by the scientific community in order for us to create social justice. So this is condition one, if you like. Principle two, uh, science um, can and should inform uh, social justice policies um, scientists need to insist that science is a global common good, as Michel Kaczynski have, have reminded us numerous times in the drafting process. Uh, science should become uh, a benefit for all citizens uh, and uh, for it to become better coordinated and better funded. It should also be used to promote justice and uh, social scientific uh, responsibility. So science also needs to get its own house in order before teaching policymakers and decision makers how to conduct um, their practice and power relations. Um, we also mentioned as principle number three in the first section that robust institutions are necessary to support science for social justice. We need strong institutions so how funding and other resources are allocated to different areas of research can have a major impact on the ability of our scientific community to promote justice for all. It needs to be built in to the assessment criteria, to the incentive structures, to the funding programs, uh, and agreed pecking order is needed in terms of setting priorities. Um, what matters for one might not matter for others. So this has to be taken into account. Moving on still in the first section of the principles and Aiden can, can cut me off uh, if, um, if we are getting into too much detail. Principle four, um, the dialogue between science policy and society is indeed truly important, but we also at the same time have to acknowledge that it is complex, citing 8 billion citizens and hundreds of diverging uh, value systems is not an excuse to accept mediocrity. Solutions and impacts needs to be co-created, but also co-opted by different communities, institutions and governments. Um, so uh, yes, uh, we can all uh, drown in bad excuses of complexity, um, but in the end of the day, we need a robust institutions focused on science for social justice um, to get uh, these priorities across. Um, so Aiden, I don't know if you want me to break off here and, 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 and start the discussion. Otherwise, I will continue with the next sections of the principles. Perhaps you can provide me with a bit of input. Thanks, David. Um, so there's going to be four sections. I think it's good to get the conversation going. Um, we purposely didn't give you the Brussels Declaration because it would overly influence what you might think today on this. Um, as an anecdote, what we were looking for, to give an example, I know Himla has just did a harm reduction conference, which was amazing last month. That conference alone would have fed so much content into this on social justice. But it's how you connect those worlds of the high-end academies who look upon a world of human rights, a bit from the 1940s, post-World War II, who are completely disconnected <clears throat> from the youth of today, who think social justice is where it's at. But you can't lecture kids about human rights, the right to access to water and electricity. It just doesn't make much happen in their day. So we want kind of your pearly wisdom. I'll give you one anecdote. David is like, um, I won't name him, but a very famous big country science advisor said that I have billions of dollars to spend on scientific advice, and I do, but at the end of the day, when I sit in front of the Secretary of State or the Minister, they say to me, if I want it, I will call it an input. If I don't want it, I can just call it lobbying. And that's how the world works. So we want to move this from just this kind of 
bland declarations that you see everywhere into real actions. And then later at the end, we had about 25 recommendations from groups involved. I think Himmler was working on the idea of a standing committee between the academies on social justice, for example. That would be revolutionary. Other people had things like social, um, social justice indexes. How would you do it? How would you tabulate all the countries of Africa, 1 to 55, and rank them on these kinds of things and so on? So complicated tools. So if we want to open up on the first one, science should empower global social justice. Can we get some comments from the floor or some open thinking on this section one? And this is the science policy nexus. How should science interact with policy? Can science be neutral interacting with policy if science is primarily funded by policy? Um, one of the arguments we always have, David probably is on the opposite side to me on this, is that about 80% of all science in the world is funded by the private sector and investments. We see science through, uh, through universities funded by the governments. Um, how easily the governments can switch science. A question comes up, there's no government in the world that pools together, for example, to fund clinical trials. They're afraid to do it. They prefer the private sector to do it for them. So you get these discussions. So could I ask the floor? I know Olive is here. Um, Solly's here from the steering committees before. Himmler's here. Um, but it's an open floor. Just press the microphone in front of you and let's get going. Who's first? Mama Mucci, I'm looking at you. You have to go. Yeah, go ahead. First and foremost, I, I really appreciate all of you for uh, focusing on how to link science, society, and policy uh, by valuing social justice and uh, not social interest or achieving all right, profit, commercial advantage, market advantage. So I just want to ask a, a question. Uh, the, the, the economic path, pathway imposes a gravity burden on society because there are divisions among the, the population. There are rich people, there are poor people, there's inequality, all these things. I, I like somehow the economy side to be integrated. Sincerely, because if, if we don't, to bring social justice, we also need to manage the economic side. Yeah. What does it mean if someone's interest is to make, through science, through advantage, all right, by building something, to achieve self-interest? No matter what social justice we, it shouldn't be social justice, you know, by uh, charity, by, uh, you know, so, uh, corporate social responsibility, all these kind of things. You give something. It mustn't be like that. It must be integrated. A new conception is needed. A uni unified theory, Einstein's type theory is necessary. To right. unify the economy, the social, the science, the engineering, everything, the environment, the health, the education. Is there any way to bring social, to achieve social justice, nature justice, we need a new relationship, a new way to think about how we do economics also. If we don't do that, then we have a problem. I, I, you may, you yeah. may, you are good in all these declarations, very nice words, but actual realization, actualization might not be possible. That's my, my worry. So Thank in you very the, much. In, that's a really good question because the reason it's broken down into sections, and David might have a better memory on this than me, is that we had to split it up into stakeholders because of the overlap. So this is primarily about what we expect from the science policymaker nexus, but in section three, we look at industry and, like for example, most people hate pharma, but they like an ambulance. Most people don't like the police, but they like clean streets. So how do you add all that up when you're, when you're making clean recommendations? So a lot of people didn't like industry and don't like industry. And for example, we brought in the heads of R&D from J&J &J and groups like this, you know, and they tell you about their problems in trying to do social justice. And I think, you know, the worldwide chairman uh, Paul Stoffels of J&J &J said in one of the meetings, David, I think, with Naledi, no, it was with Glenda Gray, um, you know, how come we can give you free uh, retrovirals to South Africa and you can't get them to every home, but you can get television, soccer, and Coca-Cola? 
So these are kind of arguments. I know that's so glib, but this uh, industry is a hard one to square. Are you talking about the money from government, Mamamuchi, how, how the compact is, or the contract is done, or are you talking about industry here? Because if we go into economics, we just go down the rabbit hole of neocolonialism and inequalities, and it's a, it's a problem. So what we're looking for is solutions-based, if we can, recommendations. Even when we do, um, you know, we ask for grants, yeah. and we get signed, you know, for research we do for data collection, all this, uh, what output we do. Sometimes also the output is, needs to also generate some, some impact also. So sometimes there is issues. I mean, uh, even on the science side, the grants we get, are they also very, are they, will they also link with social justice? The provision of outputs like that is mm. also important. I mm. think there's a need, a lot of change need to be done. The validation criteria is not uh, explicit. That, that has to be verified. Otherwise, it's going to be a challenge, I think. No, uh, the industry, all these things also come. The, the whole way by which the economics has been going. You see, is a, you know, individual. It's not, you know, an advantage you get. Okay. And then that advantage always affects uh, justice. I mean, the, the, some get excluded. Mm. Not everyone is included. All right, you have problems like that. I was recently in China. They have abolished absolute poverty, 1.5 billion people. I mean, mm. sincerely, I, I, I sincerely was amazed. Mm. I walked all over. I haven't seen any beggar. I was amazed. I, I'm sincerely telling you. In South Africa, it's the richest, one of the richest country. Justice. Okay. Justice. Okay. That has to also be added in the evaluation. The nexus has to be comprehensive and very, very well articulated, and the validation criteria must be explicit. Mm. The, you know, they must be there all the variables have to be identified, and then we know. Then we know exactly what justice, social justice achievements are. Otherwise, it's difficult. That's maybe, my suggestion. Maybe if I put you on the spot, David, I know, David, you completed the in-house review for the European Commission's Joint Research Center, for example. Um, we have four billion a year for brain research, but every country is competing with the same grants for the same people. What do you think? Is it, is it feasible to have a a novel approach to grants with social justice built in? Yes, I think so. I think it's a, it's a really um, important uh, observation and I, I, I would also um, hope to, to please you by saying that, that there are already hints to that in the declaration, but I take it that we can make it more explicit. But indeed, the funding of science uh, needs to take seriously uh, science for social justice. Um, and as, uh, as it is now, in many countries in the world, um, uh, as a matter of fact, scientific funding is often allocated to projects with a very clear economic impact. So that is impact calculated more or less on the established models of, uh, of uh, um, um, neoclassical um, e economic theory that, that uh, will create more or less status quo and, and, and sort of continue to increase growth in society. Um, this is the impact model that many funding agencies operate by, and I, I believe it's an, a tremendously important observation here to encourage funding agencies to use as a baseline um, social justice um, uh, criteria in the way that uh, research proposals are being validated and, and assessed. So I think we can bring that out more strongly. Uh, it, it needs to be definitely um, something that that um, uh, can become more clear in the document. So thank you for that. Yeah. Yes, Olive. Now, Olive, I have to put you on the spot. You're somebody who came out of the States, came back to South Africa to clean it up, and then get sucked. You, you got into the belly of the beast. You started working for the government, right? So you you... You're perfect on, on Article 2, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, this mic is not working. Sorry. Are you sure? Please. I have one here. Yeah. First of all, I want to say on that number two, uh, you might want to say scientists need to insist that science is a common public good. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. 
Uh, I think you need to put it as a um, common public good. It should not just be for, um, for common good. It should be public good. And I say so because the public is the one that supports governments to finance research. And the benefits must first accrue to the public and not to the individual mm -hmm. researcher. I take an example of uh, COVID-19 vaccines. South Africa contributed extensively in terms of uh, undertaking research in South Africa. Uh, Medical Research Council conducted research, University of Cape Town and so forth. And in the United States, we saw in terms of Pfizer and uh, Moderna, particularly Moderna, the money came from the public mm. to conduct clinical trials. And once they found that the particular vaccine was effective, then the company, the pharmaceutical company, takes that research and produces vaccines and turns around and sells it at higher prices. Mm. So the benefits accrue to an individual company, but the very people that actually contributed to it, particularly in South Africa. In the US, they got it for free, so it was a public good. But in so far as in South Africa, we couldn't get vaccines until we have contributed financially a lot more. So as a public, we didn't benefit that much from the contribution we made through our taxes. So I think it needs to be much stronger here in terms of common public good and deal with the question of the private sector in this section, yeah. not in another section, but I think it needs to be in this section. Thank you. So Olive, just to ask you back, so do you think it's a given or a, a, an error of judgment that we just automatically think that public sector scientists think their work is for a public good? Private sector scientists, it's proprietary rights, it's profit making. For example, I know that Trinity College Dublin, uh, when the government did a review of the seven national universities in the Republic of Ireland, they discovered over 70 millionaire professors who did spin-outs from the universities in health, but the money doesn't come back to the state or to the system. So would, would you argue that we should split their public and private scientists, or what would you recommend? Well, I think it's, it should be, I, I think those scientists should also be brought to book. They cannot go and benefit so much more with taxpayers' money to enrich themselves to become millionaires. Mm. Whether in South Africa or in Ireland or in the US, they shouldn't be. It's a public good. If you go into science and pay for by the taxpayer, mm. the first beneficiaries must be the public and not the individual scientist. I know they have to be compensated somehow, but they don't have to be extremely comp compensated so much so that they become millionaires when they walk around, they find that everyone else around them is poor. It can be. Yeah. That's a good point, David. Yes, indeed. Very good point. Um, but should we keep I, it in I this section or, that, or should we have a comment in this section? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be good to have that comment here. Yes, for, for sure. I think it's, it's, it's um, the, word, the word common good or global common good was something that was discussed quite intensively again in the drafting committee because my colleagues uh, were were opting for a sort of a non-economic term for a, a common good whereas a public good of course is a sort of an economic uh, good provided by the by the state to repair uh, so to speak a market failure something that the market will not provide but i actually like uh, uh, the common public good i think that would be a nice synthesis and and I, I also follow 100% uh, the comments just being made here. It, it's uh, tremendously uh, important, again, to stress that science must um, and should contribute um, to the public uh, well-being uh, of our society rather than only a select few um, scientists who, who are uh, sort of keeping uh, the, the knowledge uh, at their own disposal. This is a related problem that we are not really addressing in the declaration, but I think we could find an elegant way of, of pointing it out here. 
a lot of the research that is being produced today worldwide is being codified in patents. It's even being put behind paywalls in extremely expensive journals. And, and that means that when we need to get access for, for that research, for example, to create better evidence-based policies for social justice, we, as a matter of fact, have to pay for that research one more time. So not only did we pay for producing it in the first place, but we end up also paying to get access. So again, think about vaccines and diagnostics and many other technologies that was already funded by the public purse. So the idea to keep that research and that knowledge and expertise and evidence in the public domain is a, is a major driving force also behind the declaration. So, so very, very happy we could have this conversation. So would we, the next section we'll look at scientific community and we can maybe flesh out. But for this section, I, I want to hear from people who are working in government, have worked for government, have worked in the private sector, public sector, education, so on. Because David mentioned a very important point is that nobody looks at the gap between giving scientific advice and taking it. And what you do when the gap is too big and you're not being listened to. I want to put on the spot maybe Sully, because Sully, you're chairman of the health committee on mental health, for example. But, so you're active right now advising. What, can you give us your insights here to this? What, how do we get the science policy making community to properly engage the scientific community to make what we call the difference between evidence-based policy making versus policy biased evidence making? I gave you the example, we want to hit China with plastic toys, so we put a bogus committee together to get at the plastic. That's the policy coming first and then you find the science. Like in your experience, how much is the science bubbling up and informing policy in a neutral way? Or how hard is that glass ceiling to get through? For example, post-COVID, I'm sure you have mental health problems all over South Africa like we have in Europe, but is there more funding coming in? Um, are you looking at people with uh, underlying mental health issues from before and how it's exacerbated now under COVID and so on? How does it work that you can advise a minister to change direction, funding, uh, go live nationally with new comments, convince the president. How does that work inside South Africa? Yeah, thank you very much, Sharon. Um, I really want to comment on how that committee functions, but um, I was looking at point number three on the robust institutions and um, that have to exist. But I just thought that, you know, this seems to be a hanging statement. Is it robust in terms of funding only, or is it robust in terms of debates? Hmm. Uh, in all these four points, I find something lacking, which is the freedom for scientists to do what they do best. You know, I think freedom, the atmosphere of freedom for scientists is very important. Uh, when you have to advise a minister, you also have to be cognizant of uh, what that minister or that ministry wants. There are, there are issues, and I can cite an example here uh, that may not be, that is very sensitive. At the moment, we're looking at, for instance, uh, harm reduction, for instance, tobacco harm reduction and so on. And, and the scientists are trying to work hard to look at alternatives to delivering safer nicotine because people love nicotine. We don't, need, we don't know exactly what nicotine does to the brain. That science is not coming out very clearly. But, but when you have to develop an advisory to the minister, you should have taken note of what exists in terms of the scientific world. But uh, there's an element of uh, very subtle coercion, suppression of uh, the truth, in that you are not openly uh, bringing out information about uh, alternatives, for instance, to combustible uh, tobacco. So, so the robustness, robust, robustness in, in funding should be accompanied by robust, robustness in debates, in discourse. Because if you don't have that, then the scientists are not free to do what they do best and to advise. They will be advising on the basis of uh, where the money comes from. So I don't know how we factor in the element of freedom to do scientific work without fear or favor, favoring institutions that support you financially. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would like that to come out very clearly somewhere. I don't know where that can be factored in. Yeah. 
on that point, and it's a, a question back to you, um, the Irish Chief Science Advisor, Mark Ferguson, who was the, the main science advisor for the economic panel in, in, in the European Union until two years ago, he said on this point was that for him, um, if you're advising the ministers and you're a Chief Science Advisor or you're in a ministry per se, if you try to show off and make everything look public, then the, 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 the discussions go underground and the voltage gets higher, that's what he said. Sometimes the debates are just, just to make it look like it's open and transparent. How would we get the science that you're talking about to actually switch? Where could you show that that science has changed the content or the direction of the law? Or, you talked about tobacco harm reduction, I mean, is a good example. Um, has any government asked uh, for a study on how vaping has saved lives? I mean, I don't know. But your thing about more debate, everyone says that in the declarations. More stakeholders, more. But, but where would you concretely, are you allowed to make public your meetings with your minister, for example, the content? Yeah, I would, I would really throw that question back to Olive and other people in the hall here. Okay. Because I think uh, it's a very sensitive issue hmm. uh, in the sense that uh, when you have done scientific work and want to develop, and you've developed an adversary to the ministry, you want a clear follow-up that there's been an attempt at least at implementation hmm. and there's been openness and not suppression of what the scientists wanted to achieve or what not necessarily the scientists but what science wanted to achieve. Uh, I really would like to hear Olive's comments on that point. Yeah, come in Olive again, please. Okay, we come a long way on this issue of evidence-based solutions. Yeah. Really long way. I recall when I was still at the Human Science Research Council, um, and at the time I was uh, executive director responsible for HIV. We tried very, very hard from the HSRC to push for evidence-based policy making. It became a real big issue. So one time there was a big seminar that, it was a big conference actually, which was led by uh, Minister Naledi Pandu. And she stood up and she said, I believe the HSRC is right when they say we must use evidence-based policy making. From that time onward, the South African government started using evidence-based solutions. And I can say in what areas that I know about. On HIV, we conducted a, a research in the country when President uh, Tabumbeki was anti-science in so far as yeah. HIV causes AIDS. He was totally against it. President Mandela agreed to give us money to undertake research in 10,000 random sample, stratified sample of 10,000 South Africans and we came back and we said 10% of South Africans are HIV positive. Wow. And we showed it where they are in terms of areas, what race, what education, you know, and so forth, and all of those variables. On the basis of that, there was now an agreement to give antiretroviral therapy because of the science. Even the activists that were calling for it they were able to use information from the research to say this is a problem that's very common. Well, the second example I just want to give very briefly is on COVID-19. When President Ramaphosa was making decisions in terms of what to communicate to the nation about, I mean, about COVID-19, he actually brought scientists to come to cabinet to come and present the position that should be taken. And at that meeting, the decision was taken at that meeting on what policy the, the, the president and the cabinet should take. If there's one success story of um, science informing policy, very direct is this particular one on COVID-19, when people like Slim Karim hmm. came into cabinet and spelled out clearly to say, this is what you need to do. That information was even useful when we went to court because some contested this. We were able to produce a scientific evidence that informed us. Thank you. 
Maybe I'll put Francois on the spot on this one. So just, just he's up from you here. So Francois, we, we have the famous quote from Kofi Annan that um, drugs have killed many people, but bad policies have killed many more, for example. And I, I know that we have Mandy Smallhorn here as president of the South African Science Journalist Association, so you can come next on the testing. In, in sense of being a doctor and in a doctor's group, I mean, is it possible to get your thinking, your advice, your knowledge of the patients? Um, for example, in Europe, if a, if a lady came into you in your dispensary and you could see needle marks in her arm, but she's coming in because she's got, I don't know, an acid reflux problem, you're not allowed to talk to her about the needle in the arm stuff, for example. Um, the systems are very strict. We have free, but on the other side, we have Freedom of Information Acts in countries like Denmark, Ireland, Italy, Spain, where every citizen can see who was in the meeting with the minister, what was the agenda. They might not see the discussions. Uh, but at the same time, we feel a little bit more in control. Is this just impossible to do in the, in the Global South, or what would you recommend as a doctor? I don't understand why it's not possible. Mm -hmm. I've never understood why it's not possible. I'm a firm believer in transparency, and I think that we do ourselves a disservice by coming up with convoluted um, reasons for it. In fact, in South Africa, I would argue that some of our biggest successes has been having transparent process. As you say, you don't need to know who said what in the meeting. I think we need to know who attended those meetings and what they need to happen. And one of the biggest successes, I would argue, is often that South Africa in the health selection process of which drugs we use, what our guidelines processes are, who attended them, has meant actually that our guidelines are actually rock solid, Good. including not just in HIV, but in many of the chronic disease mm -hmm. processes. And that's because we select people from multiple institutions, they sit behind closed doors, they fight it out, but there's a closed group of experts that sit there. And I think one thing I must emphasize is often people with incomplete information, like you will have somebody who's a clinician who doesn't know what the cost of a blood test is, or what the absolute cost of a drug is, or what the complexity of manufacturing that drug is. You'll have a laboratory technician who knows how difficult it is to do that lab test, that they can only do so many per day, and it's impossible to do that test at the volumes that the clinician wants. You'll have a policymaker who understands how hard it is to procure those tests internationally in the global market. You'll have a, a, a clinic manager who doesn't understand. You need all those people in the room together to bring together when you select a, a guideline change, to make sure they're all in the room together. And then you need the patients to say, these are the things that make sense to us. You know, there are only so many um, you know, choices, for instance, that we need to have. And South Africa actually has got that right. We've got the EDL, we have a couple of like, committees that work really, really well, to my mind. Not perfectly, but they work pretty well. They're transparent, they make their decisions, they're not without, as I said, the criticism that goes at them. And they produce guidelines that I would argue are often world class, often way ahead of their, the rich country counterparts. So there are models where we fell down, this is where Olive and I actually disagree with her, her, um, her characterization of, say, the COVID-19 response and of the HIV response at the, at the time, is that where that transparency falls apart or where those programs of putting people and holding them and having the right people in the room to, to communicate that is where um, I would argue that falls apart. I think that these models are established and are, and are doable and are actually quite successful where they, where they put forward. And, and those experts you're talking about, are there systems in place to know who they are, how they're appointed, why they're there, or can groups from the third sector, charities, are they invited in these meetings? The Absolutely. citizens groups, the patients groups? If you take groups? something as controversial, say for instance, as this field you're talking about, is, is to remove them from the everyday um, discourse of, um, you know, the, 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 the kind of controversies that exist within the society, and often exist in quite a moral sort of pandemic, is to put the experts in the place and come forward with calm recommendations to put them in front of the minister. I'd often hear the ministers talking about things which it's not possible for one person to be an expert in. Mm. You know, to hear the minister talking about antiretroviral resistance is not fair on him. You know, he's not an expert. This stuff is arcane, mm. deep, dark stuff that I might be an expert in, but you know, it's not fair for him to be able to pronounce on public television to be an expert on. To ask him to talk about you know, drug harm reduction is not, it's not entirely fair for him to be au fait on every, every part of that, that, that policy. So I, I think it's important to put people in the background, to come up with policy, to put trusted experts in charge of it, bring everybody in who needs to be in on that conversation, to come up with recommendations that are calm, and then come up with stuff that is conscious of the fiscus, of the of the, the public health care system, the private health care system, what the country can tolerate, and sit down and come up with stuff that is implementable in that process. Okay. 
because I know Mandy has to run away, and I know, Mandy, I was taught that a journalist, a good journalist, is like a doctor. They have to press you until it hurts, right? That's the job. So do you have a quick comment on this kind of, this section on how do we get it right between policymakers and scientists? In your experience as a journalist, is it easy for you to get to the bottom of how something worked or didn't work, who influenced outcomes, review systems? No. Just press the button. Yeah. <laughs> no. Because of this gap in communication, and that's what I was going to talk about, is that this is not actually talking about this nexus here between policymakers and scientists, but what happens next is how is that communicated to the public? And I would say that, you know, COVID-19, for instance, there was quite a lot of poor communication to the public that went on, and that early on, uh, resulted in misunderstanding in the public. This is obviously the job that I'm supposed to be doing. But if you don't have uh, a transparency coming from um, the policy makers and the scientists towards you as a journalist, you can't do that job. And it's a really, really important job. And I wanted to go back to what Olive was talking about. I wrote down here the term co-creators. And that's something that I see in... Uh, this attitude towards the public that I see in documents like this quite often is that they are the objects of what's happening, as it were. And I think that the public are co-creators of science. They, are, they, they pay the tax that enables the education, that enables scientists to emerge out of a society. They pay the tax that funds research. And very often in that critical way that... You were talking about, I mean, I know this from cancer trials. They are actually the subjects of research. They are actually the people who enable you to have some findings. And then they get dumped. They get abandoned at the end of it without even quite often a, a decent explanation, let alone continuing care. I would like to see a slight shift in the way the public is characterized here. The public is a stakeholder and part of science, and they ought to feel that way. They ought to feel they have a stake in science, that they're invested in science. This is why I should care about how science is done and why it's done. I should be able to advocate in terms of funding, the pecking order that you spoke of, that kind of thing. And, you know, just to go back to my personal hobby horse, that's why science journalists are important and need we, we have a kind of nexus but with scientists and government and other stakeholders that is critical to enable that relationship ultimately between the findings and the users of the findings, the beneficiaries of the findings, mm -hmm. to be a beneficiary, beneficial relationship. Okay. So, David, I think we should move on to the next section, unless somebody else has a comment on yes. the first one. Anybody? So we have a lot more text uh, from policymakers. Yeah. One second. We have a lot more text that we didn't share with you on purpose from what the policymakers see. Like they're basically saying, get away from me. You're, you're just scientists. I have to look at bigger picture, election cycles, uh, what people really want, international collaborations and stuff. So we will give you back this with more text so you can come back online and feed back into the policy groups, no problem. But now we want to look at what's expected from the scientific community. And David, you can take over again. Yes. And I think, Aidan, what I will do is I will go through two sections now, and, the, and then uh, you, can, you can moderate the discussion um, so that we don't get, um, that we don't get uh, late on timing uh, and, and collect these very important uh, comments. So uh, section two is about what we should expect from the scientific community in terms of promoting science for social justice, some of which have already now been mentioned in, the, in this very informed discussion. Principle five is about the integrity of science and its centrality. Uh, we state here that both scientific and societal progress require universal and rigorous research standards that guarantee the quality and the reliability, and you could even add reproducibility of scientific knowledge. So um, referring to um, standards of peer review of, um, again, evidence validation um, 
and testing are, are, are central to integrity. The same goes for conflicts of interest um, and tra transparency, as was already mentioned uh, this afternoon. Principle number six, uh, all scientific disciplines uh, should inform uh, policy interventions for social justice. This is something that lies very close to my own heart, um, having worked within the humanities and the social sciences for two decades. Um, we often overlook all the important uh, scientific advice, evidence and analysis that can be adopted from the social sciences and the behavioral sciences and focuses sometimes very exclusively only on the natural and technical sciences, which in particular on the topic of social justice um, could create biases and, and even a wrong headed solution. So, all scientific disciplines should get invited to uh, produce advice and to inform uh, interventions and shape new policies on social justice. So to fully mobilize science for, for social justice, human, the human and social sciences, as well obviously as the natural health and technical sciences, needs to be better aligned to common goals. So interdisciplinary collaboration, um, a G7 versus G20 power mindset exists between the sciences um, with sort of the elite scientists on top and, and the rest of us um, uh, placed uh, further down in the hierarchy. Um, and this is damaging to group action prospects. We uh, straight, uh, state quite dramatically, but I think it's, there is a lot of truth to it that we need to sort of be able to advise and communicate um, research on a more equal uh, basis among the disciplines. Sometimes really the solutions um, are from the social sciences rather than the technical ones. Uh, principle seven, uh, scientists need to engage with citizens and stakeholder groups early and upstream, including vulnerable groups and groups without institutional capacities. And with that we mean uh, groups which might not be part of the traditional institutional landscape and which might not have a voice um, that can be heard in, in, in newspapers in, at scientific conferences, but that we as, as scientists and scientific institutions need to empower and, and listen to. So here scientists should accept their responsibility to translate their knowledge into forms that are understandable for society at large, especially where research aims to provide social progress. Publicly funded science is exactly that. Uh, and the private sector generates 80% of all research, yet coordination between um, uh, public and private groups are, are, are weak. And, and also the, the ability of our scientific um, funding systems, again, to listen to and include vulnerable groups in the programming of interventions and the shaping up of interventions is crucial to this principle seven. Uh, finally, I believe in this section, principle eight, uh, scientists must listen and respond to the needs of citizens and inform and shape interventions co-designed with affected groups, citizens, patients, uh, and policymakers. Responding to the needs of citizens requires that citizens have a voice and that scientists empower these stakeholders to take an active part in designing solutions and creating interventions. So people power should be reflected in our R&D decisions stated here in principle eight. Um, with insight to the time, Aiden, I think I will also introduce you to section three, um, and then we will see if, if there is time enough available to also go uh, later on into section uh, four and five. Um, but here we switch the focus, not no longer focusing on what is what is required by the scientific community, but rather what we can expect from the policy community, these are the two groups, including uh, civil society, that needs to work together. Um, policymakers should uh, respect a role for experts and evidence in shaping new policies. Uh, they need to be held accountable and should accept public scrutiny, uh, disclaimed in principle nine. 
They should keep that door open and include academic advisors, but also third sector, civil society groups and NGOs in uh, what was already discussed now earlier today in uh, as a public dialogue, especially when this has consequences or impact on social justice or rather the lack thereof. Principle 10 uh, policies should improve social justice outcomes and we could add should be evaluated on their social justice outcomes. The ethical responsibility of improving human health, planetary health and also societal health clearly lies with elected policymakers. Politicians need to be made more aware of the short and long term social justice impacts of their decisions. And this is again um, a shared responsibility with scientists and researchers and experts in to provide those data and provide those evaluations. Examples of good social justice outcomes ought to be flagged and travel between jurisdictions more easily. So we can have more peer learning and, and learn from each other in, in, in terms of what works and perhaps what works um, less well in, in, uh, in specific circumstances. Principle 11, uh, policymakers uh, must challenge um, uh, science to deliver on, uh, on social uh, and, and public uh, uh, justice. So policymakers also have an active role to play in coming back to a point that was raised earlier today, namely designing and uh, uh, funding systems and also incentives for universities and, and acknowledging researchers who are willing to deliver uh, input on science for public justice. Uh, and they need to continue to challenge sciences not only to be as it were, uh, sitting in the ivory tower, but working uh, into practice, into real world outcomes for uh, affected communities. So providing access to science, open science, open access, utilizing science to empower social groups should not only be looked upon as an aspiration, it is said here, but should define explicit goals. This goes back to several of the comments made this afternoon. This includes using scientific evidence as a guide uh, to help define and achieve faster and better results for social justice programs. So again, at the Science Policy Nexus, use scientific institutions to, to co-create solutions and also evaluate whether or not they work so that we also have an evaluation program that is uh, evidence-based. And finally, in I believe in, in uh, section two, or in section three, sorry, uh, policymakers, uh, principle number 12 here, policymakers should support institutions of independent scientific advice. Again, uh, somewhat overlapping with the uh, role of integrity and transparency. Scientific advisors are few and far better on the global stage who the experts are, how they are appointed. Again, transparency issues and how they are held accountable remains a crucial uh, cause for concern. Where they do exist, they need space to provide a balanced account, a multidisciplinary account, um, and also an honest uh, account without fear of sanctions or ideological pressures, what I believe Aiden called uh, the risk of uh, policy biased um, evidence. Oh, there was a third, 13th principle, Policymakers should acknowledge social justice outcome uh, in and informed by uh, science. Uh, governmental institutions are politically responsible for their initiatives. Uh, of course, they must not appear to hide behind expert advice uh, that they use to legitimize uh, unpopular decisions. Uh, rather, policymakers have a responsibility to listen to sound, rigorous and independent advice. One could add here perhaps diverse advice from different groups and different disciplines, while at the same time not outsourcing policy decisions to experts. Um, these are these are crucial points in uh, section three. I will I will pause there, Aiden. Thanks, David. So we've just heard a little bit. It's probably all too obvious to mention for most of you, 
but let's get some views from maybe the other side of the room. I mean, who, who's actually a young practicing bench scientist in the room? Is there anybody actually doing research right now? It's good. Good, good, good. Good, good. So this, I mean, what David said sounds perfect, but I mean, who can challenge the politicians and the source of the funding? That's quite tricky. And what David mentioned with G20, G7, BRICS, EU27, I mean, they're fiercely competitive systems. So I'm Irish, but I live in Belgium. And when I'm abroad here, I have to pretend that we're EU and we're one. But when you live in the system, it's 27 viciously competitive systems taking each other down for advantage if they can, public and private. So it would be interesting to see what scientists think about the four or five principles and what scientists should or should not be doing. Does anyone have any comments? Yeah, thanks, Aidan. Um, my name is Mosa Mushavela from the University of Kosovo Natal. Um, I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation and also the Chairperson of the NRF Board. I want to speak from the perspective of scientists um, on this and just mention a few things quickly. I think the first thing I want to mention is I think, as it's, it's already been said, in South Africa, we, we don't have a big, big problem in terms of the link between science and policy. Our biggest problem is that we've got a lot of good policy documents that we don't translate into practice and therefore we don't see the impact in society. So for me, um, in as much as we do need to improve that interface between science and policy, I think that the biggest area we need to improve is how to translate policy into, into impact. We, we're using social justice, and we probably don't have the same uh, conception of what social justice means or mm -hmm. is. But for me, if the benefit of science does not translate into results on the ground for the public, then, and, and for all groups, not certain groups over others, in, an, in, a, in a way that is equitable, then we are not necessarily coming, coming close to, to social justice. So I would like in that section one to make sure that we add society to that so that the nexus is not just between science and policy. I mean, for us in South Africa, the connection between policy and society is really very important. Mm -hmm. um, I also, the second point I want to mention is from the perspective of scientists, I, we are guided by three principles. The first is academic freedom. And oftentimes that's the one that we talk most about, the freedom to explore, do science in a way that, you know, there's no interference from funders, policymakers, and so forth. But we are also guided by public accountability. We don't often talk about that. And I think as scientists, we also need to talk a lot more about public accountability because that's the principle that also helps us to ask the right questions, the questions that matter to society. That's the principle that helps us to take our findings to the platforms where science benefits and results actually matter. So public accountability is something we have to talk a lot more about. And also, of course, we are guided by institutional autonomy. We do want to make sure that there is autonomy. And from where I'm sitting, we shouldn't even be discussing the question of whether evidence from science should be accessible or not. We could be discussing how to make it more accessible because it is in itself by its nature a public good. It should be. But the problem is that we are trying to solve a problem that has invaded science, co-modifying science, in a way that has made science and its results inaccessible to the people who need those benefits. And we are not confronting that. We have a serious problem of control around intellectual property. And and um, David started mentioning it in terms of patents and so forth. But that's a major problem that we need to talk about and how that is controlled. We have a problem around funding. And just because you may have a few rotten apples, then we must not 
now scold all of science community as if everybody now is influenced by their funders. No, we don't want that. Anyone who's going to fund science needs to know that scientists need to have the independence of mind to be able to drive research and to communicate that research. But of course, you know, the mistrust that we now have, the mistrust that we now have, that we are not confronting and we are not dealing with, is going to undermine a lot of what scientists do. The other thing that I just want to mention around that is the fact that in as much as we, we as scientists want to make science available, the system in which we work has not created conditions for us to engage in the communication of science, has not necessarily created the space for us to engage with stakeholders, communities, in a way that can elevate people power in a way, from what is intended in the statement. I think we need to institutionalize processes that make that obvious. I'll give you an example. If you give me a grant for three years and I have to do project management around that, a lot of the engagements that you would expect, and if they are to be done properly, they will consume a lot of time that makes it difficult for me to meet the deadlines around the, the project that I have to do. So those constraints would make it difficult for scientists, but we then have to make sure that we allow the flexibility that is built into scientific processes in order to ensure that these activities are included, both in terms of engaging communities, but also, and, and co-creating, by the way, and also in terms of um, engaging uh, policymakers. The last thing I, I want to mention is that I think when it comes to number 11, the issue of ensuring that there is science is able to deliver on the public justice, I think really there is one part that is really a specific mandate around social justice, and I don't expect every scientist to do that. But there is mm -hmm. another part which is a mandate around ensuring that this, the, the, the goods that come from science are accessible to everyone, and I think scientists need to ensure that. And, and for me, I think we need to separate those. I, I don't know how we communicate it clearly here, but we, we, must, not, we must not conflate them. Aidan, on section four, I know we're still going to go to it. I would like to request that we separate the public and the media from industry. There's a whole lot of discussions we need to have around industry that I think that we cannot conflate with the public. Um, if we do that, then we're going to miss out on opportunity to discuss some of the issues that I think are, are pertinent, including misinformation and, and private interests and so forth. Thank, thanks. Excellent points. Thank you so much. Can we get a comment from the two bench scientists here? Have you anything to add, if possible? I get some of the younger thoughts across today. Um, perhaps Prof. of I go first. Um, so, you know, it's, um, it's quite interesting that you say that 80% of, um, of science is funded by the private sector, which we fully agree with. But when you have global authorities like the WHO, who in their Global Alcohol Action Plan, for example, which was approved at the World Health Assembly <coughs> in 2022, specifically states that the alcohol industry, for example, is to refrain from funding research. Now that then puts a huge sort of um, restraint on the type of science that is being produced in that space. Because what you find is, for example, the, the anti-alcohol lobbyists who have their own little group are exposed to that funding and they're pr producing science based on their narrative only. And that then uh, results in very skewed interpretation and it's going to skew the policies. And then how do we as young scientists fight global authorities like WHO when those policies are made when they don't consider um, the benefits that these industries can bring towards science? That's just my comment. Well, I mean, we, we had the WHO in meetings with the UN, Ban Ki-moon's health advisor, but the WHO only came to do a walkout because we invited industry. So, right. if, but the problem I have is if you're a science advisor, let's say from New Zealand, you don't talk about this. And when you leave and you get a job at the International Science Council in Paris or UNESCO, it suddenly becomes important that 
You want to talk to the sugar industry if you want to look at sugar tax. But give you a simple question as South Africans. If you care about the environment, why do you still have plastic straws here and nobody cares? Why is there alcohol advertising all day long during sports? So like sometimes the, the science that's done elsewhere is so obvious and can be translated, but where's the anger in the scientific community? That's what I'm trying to get at. That's what we're trying to get in these sections. How come it doesn't add up? We're not looking for rocket science. We're looking for the basics. So that's my question back to you all. What I think we should do, David, is unless you have any more comments, is like take a coffee break. And I think we have to do a group photograph. Is that correct? On the steps? Is that it? Yeah. And then back. And then we can keep going because I know people probably need a break. David, can you stay on a little bit later? Um, We're going yeah, to have a quick break I, I for like 10, 15 minutes. But uh, yes. Okay. So we break now. It's 10 to 4. We grab a quick coffee picture back for 4 o'clock, 4 or 5, latest. Is that okay? Okay, let's go. Good, we're back. We didn't lose too many, that's good. Everyone got their coffee. So we will be quick again. Um, Mama Mucci, you had a comment. Do you want to use the microphone again? Yeah. Uh, no, my comment is, uh, <clears throat> I think when we say social justice, we also need intellectual justice. Why I say that is because I was recently doing research on uh, the nuclear contamin uh, radioactive contamination on water, it, uh, which has become a global challenge. Mm. What is taking place in Japan is affecting South Africa also. So we have now a serious problem. What I, I, we found in the research is that the Japanese who do the research, the scientists, they, on the radioactive output and impact, they give you different on the same thing they do research, but they give you different outputs. So the, the scientists themselves, the ethical standard of the scientists who do it is a problem. Uh, there is, it's a serious challenge because Japan uh, does not have a lot of natural resources, gas, coal, coal all right? Natural gas, all these things, oil. And then it used to import uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, from yeah. from Russia, because of Ukraine-Russia war, now the coal it doesn't get it. So they now, even though they have crisis in the Fukushima, they still rely very much in using this nuclear plant, radioactive, uh, water-contaminated waste that is affecting the oceans, the Pacific area and so on, including South Africa is related to all the oceans. So it's also, uh, this is also affecting it, not also America, everywhere. So we have a, a challenge. What do we do also to get ethical standard? Uh, we do it in our, with our students when they do PhD, everything. They must pass through strict ethical standards. If they don't, we don't allow them to complete a PhD thesis. I'm sincerely telling you. So it's extremely important we also get the scientists to actually be ethically all right, at a level where it makes sense. Now we're having serious global challenge with this uh, nuclear water contamination. I just wanted to just give you a concrete example. Not just uh, the policymakers and all this, but also first, even scientific research. Is it done with high ethical standard? And there, is there ethical justice also? with uh, intellectual justice. I think that's very important. But, but who, who, in your mind, who defines this kind of ethics for social justice? Like, for example, um, like the Wild West, you only have sheriffs when the, the first million dollars is made illegally and then you need the sheriff to make sure someone else doesn't make it. If I look back at the EU, we banned DVD players from Japan for six years until a French competitor could compete. We banned GMOs until the Spanish could compete. Isn't this kind of a part of the problem, that it's, it's, it's kind of xenophobia, it's uh, region against region. So my question back to you, would the ethics be regional, would it be global, would the social justice be done at local levels, international levels, or is all this kind of a dream that you could have a charter for everybody? 
Um, you gave the example of Japan. Right now, we're going to be quite anti-Japanese for a while, but then it will, it will fade off because we need them as partners for tech, for example. So what, what's your message with the, with the, with the water story? Like, what's intellectual justice vis-a-vis -vis ethics? But I think it's a very important question you're asking. We have, as you say, the United Nations, the G20, mm -hmm. G7, all BRICS, many things. We have all these uh, uh, associations, and sometimes the scientists also engage. But what standard? What is the ethical standard? They need, you know, to pass or not pass. That standard has to be for everyone, uh, mm -hmm. universally. In other words, it must be done like that. If it's not, it's a problem. Now I'm hearing that the G20 is going to happen, and now the, the, the Indians have now said the future, all right, the Earth, and uh, they are saying that they should be one together. Or they you, you use their own vessel to have a good backup. Don't treat some people as strangers and some relatives. Let's all become together in one. Is there any standard we can set that ethically also that the scientists also behave? And, and not and not just send the the knowledge they they create, and then the policymakers use it or whatever, and then it's the impact on society becomes negative and positive depending on what's happening now with the water, because this radioactive thing is happening. But Japan says I need it for electricity. <laughs> South Africa also uses uh, six percent of its electricity, ESCOM everything comes from uh, <laughs> nuclear side, but it's not a lot. South Africa doesn't have a lot of nuclear things, but uh, now they are having also, you know, uh, many problems on the electricity side, but they are also going to have problems on the water side. I'm just scared for South Africans too. Okay. Uh, you know, it's not nice. Yeah, question at the back here. You have your microphone. Um, thank you, Aidan. Um, Niraj Mystery from Future Africa at uh, University of Pretoria. So there's a continuum here. We have good science that informs policy for social impact, and then particularly looking at some sort of social justice impact, addressing inequities, vulnerable populations, etc. And along that continuum, there's a lot of challenges. So one, I think, is we produce the science, and we there's almost an expectation that policymakers interpret that science. And the science gets interpreted by which administration is currently in charge, or how loud the opposition might be, or how much misinformation they might be uh, in the air. Um, and, and so policy makers are not a homogenous group. And we saw solid science the world over um, uh, being interpreted in different ways, misinterpreted based on political affiliations. Um, and and so, so that's one part of it. Um, and I think what I, I'd love to see as part of this process is two particular things. One is, how do we embark on a process that has more equitable engagement among various stakeholders, including various political parties? We, in order to do this, and I'm going to use the C word, coalition approaches might be uh, an approach that we take. So it's not a single party dominance or opposition, but we have to work on this together with civil society, the faith-based community, and this, the role of the scientist does not stop at the end of research. It has to continue as part of um, that uh, social impact process, implementation side of things. And I think we do yeah. have some examples of this. When we look at the various commissions, for example, Lancet commissions on particular disease issues, when we look at commissions in South Africa that were conducted, like the King Commission around HIV, those were processes that were much more engaging across various stakeholders. Um, so, so the process is one, and then the packaging is the other. How do we package our science that is objective, that is not just based on a particular expert, but a group of experts. And I think the commission process might also lend itself to that in a way that is digestible for policymakers across various parties um, and in a way that takes the science uh, to implementation. Okay, good point. Yes. 
Thank you so much. Um, my name is Toto Matsidi, so I'm from Department of Science and Innovation. I'm also um, a working group member of the Science Diplomacy Initiative, which is your host today. Um, I have three points to make. The first one, I think um, our colleagues have, have labored on the pain, but mine is more about the, the government spending on, on science research which at the end of the day um, we, we say the, the scientists or, or the institution need also to make sure that the, the community benefit. Just for example, last week we were in a meeting and one of um, my colleagues, I think from the NRF, was saying, made an example that recently we've had water issues around Pretoria and um, the, the, the scientists will go and engage the community about the water and everything, and they will make a report and feedback and so. But at some point, anyone who would want to refer to the findings of that report, you, you'll find in some websites that report will be locked, meaning that we have to pay to access that report. At that time, maybe you are even a student or, or mm -hmm. something like that. So. That brings me to a second point that we, we need to, as part of the pillars of social justice, look at the issue of open science as well, to say how do we integrate that to make sure that the, the, the conducted research results are accessible and, and, and um, um, uh, people can use them for free. The, the other issue, which I also agree to, to my colleague over here, to separate the, the public as well as the industry and the media. Um, because it, it, it really has an um, impact on the issue of science communication. Like, like they say, justice delayed is justice denied. So as, as government, as a private sector conducting research, that research should be communicated, and timelessly so. I, I think, um, I mean, we, we, we all have seen situations or instances whereby you, you receive a whole box of, of documents or booklets of a research that was conducted. But when you have a look at it, then you realize that this is 2023. These booklets were of a research conducted in 20. Oh five. I mean, mm. at, okay, it's information, but is it still valid? Because there could have been research uh, that has happened in between. So also when communication of, 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 of research or, or so is that, it should be done timelessly so that it doesn't get overtaken by events. Because if we say, well, we communicate, but when do we communicate? We should now be communicating results of a, a post-COVID analysis and so forth, and, and going into the next or whatever, um, going back to what happened before COVID, other than now communicating things that were researched, filed, and, and so forth. So those are my three points. Thank you. Just quickly on that, because in Himmler's conference on human rights, we talked a lot about this, and what was clear, Himmler, was that a lot of the audience from the academies didn't have a clue the difference between science communication, science propaganda, science journalism, investigative journalism, and I think I would never believe a report coming from any own institute. If that's the case, the German Environment Agency never told anyone about the diesel vehicle car emission scandal. It took the European Commission to find it. So the question would be, who do you trust and who has access? Would, would um, a Nigerian journalist get the rights through DSI to look at these reports if they ask for it? Yeah, you know, the, the source is very important. Um, and the source in this instance will be the person who was funded to do the research, as well as the funder. I mean, yeah. when, when government gives you a grant to conduct a research for three years, in those three years, you should be reporting uh, uh, to your funder as frequent as possible. And one other thing, Lake, that I, I, I know we also missing as government is that at some point we want to go as government and report 
on the projects that we have, we have, we have as government funded, and leaving out the the, the, the the researcher, or the researcher will go and report without government, without the funder, the projects that they have done. And I think this should be a, a, a combined effort, whereby, as government, we will say from the policy perspective, this is what we see from the results of the project. And the researcher will make a point from the technical or the scientific point that, well, this is how I see things, and you can be able to match the two. So to answer your question shortly, the source is both the funder as well as the implementer of the project. You, you can't have any other observer reporting on something they were not part of. Then that's when the issue of the source will, will, will come, and they can be reporting without quoting. The, the, the originator of, of, of the research. So on this point, for example, David can come in. Um, the European Commission would hire a person like David or someone else to do a critique of its own in-house services. You would never allow yourself to do it. Normally they'd hire a former science advisor to do it. Himlin was mentioning to me that, for example, the impact, 10-year impact capacity of the academy, you can no longer ask your own academy to do it. You have to go external. So I think this is opening up, but what interests me from the audience, what hasn't come out today at all is the, the public goods access from fourth industrial revolution up to first industrial revolution. Tomorrow we will hear fantastic brain research results from America. No one in South Africa is doing that. So how do you get access to it? Or even their research from 10 years ago. So that's what we're talking about in social justice, how you can develop systems and mechanisms that the people who haven't funded the research can have access. It's, I don't think it's all about funding. I think this is part of the systematic problem that you're bringing up. You know, just because you fund it doesn't mean you should only have access to it. If you get me? Yes. Or we'll take one over here from Nazimo. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Nazimo um, from the CSIR, also um, part of the SDCFA working group, the Science Diplomacy Capital. Science Diplomacy Capital for Africa Initiative. Um, you know, I think what I'm going to say is somewhat related to what the Professor Momomuchi said and the gentleman at the back there. But I want to put it in a slightly different way. Um, for example, that um, yes, there are sometimes questionable practices in uh, gathering information about you know, scientific information, interpreting that, yeah. and so on and so forth. Uh, and we need to have ethics around that. Um, what also for me is a big issue is how scientific information is utilized, is used uh, by different parts of society. For example, um, I think when one looks at I mean, this, was, this example was prompted by your example, uh, Aiden, that uh, you were just saying, you know, sort of to get us thinking. Why, if we care about the environment here, do we still use plastic straws, yeah. uh, et cetera? Um, the one that I want to use is the one of, for example, climate change. Okay? I think the, there's general consensus on that. There's broad consensus. <laughs> But how we respond as uh, the global community to that is, you know, it differs from uh, region to region. Mm. So we all can say we're all in this boat. We all need to change and we all need to save the planet. However, the question is where's the social justice in saying everybody must do the same thing, whereas, you know, a certain group of people who, in fact, would have contributed most to where we are at the moment in terms of uh, climate change, uh, have, are not being asked to do more than what uh, those who are still developing. And this is a question that I think also we need to be clear about how science gets used to now say, well, it's convenient for everybody to act in unison in concert because we're all in the same boat and we need to save it from sinking but without thinking about how does it affect those who are not at the same level of development, for example, uh, as others. We've got lots of natural resources that we could use 
to get ourselves to where we, we need to be. You gave an example of uh, how in the European Union there would have been actions to say let's find ways to exclude Japanese products mm. or Chinese products, etc. What happens now is the environmental friendliness of products now also comes to the fore to say if it was manufactured not to these standards that we in this region of the world have been able to get ourselves up to, then it's not uh, acceptable. And therefore you are now sort of locked into that perpetual uh, state of uh, underdevelopment, uh, uh, so to speak. So I think it's a, it's a very important uh, issue that we need to think about how even with these declarations, we bring in that element that elicits the social justice or the social injustice, as the case may be, of some of these uh, situations and how science gets used also to perpetuate uh, injustice. Thank you. So would you say the standards are like patents? They're, they're used to keep, keep you down in a sense? In a sense, um, to lock you out of certain, um, well, of progress, of uh, mm. economic uh, progress uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, <coughs> and yes, I think we all understand that there is a need for change, especially climate change we have now, or climate change we have now, or how we came to be where we are with climate change. Am I expected to sacrifice as much as the guy who has um, you know, developed to this point and has benefited from that and it's all now assumed to be, okay, we are equal, we are all in the same boat, it's sinking, and let's do the same to, to save it. I don't know if I'm uh, clear about that. Yeah. Any other quick point? Yes, in the back here. Just turn it on. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thank you so very much. Uh, great milestones have been achieved. Uh, the, the perspective I want to bring is more on the academia industry interface. Uh, because most of the time we expect certain, you know, responsibility from the industry, but we have not catalyzed that partnership and more of a long-term type um, of partnership because the research that you are doing in academia is transdisciplinary in nature. But you find that it's a solo type of culture where industries are doing their own and we are doing our own. So I just wanted to, on, on, in this discussion, to add that perspective that if we want to improve uh, the operations and the resilience of science systems, we have to make a way of enhancing those long-term partnership between academia and industry. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, next question. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Kuto Palani from the Academy of Science of South Africa. My comment was on number seven, um, which calls for the responsibility of scientists to communicate um, their science uh, to the community in a way that it's understandable. Um, my point is, how are we actually an encouragement that uh, actually makes scientists be able to communicate their science? Thank you. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> um, what's your opinion on scientific literacy? Because when we do these kinds of events in Europe, David would be on the side, maybe a lot of people got angry because the academics just think it's about literacy, top-down knowledge, people are stupid, you just have to educate them, and then the science is fantastic and it, it works. So what, what are you saying about literacy, per se? Um, I think from a South African perspective, um, so the science literacy is basically lacking from the basic education level, basically. When we talk about science, as a person that grew up in the rural areas, I'm thinking about um, astronauts, and, and I'm not thinking about water purification, for mm. example, as science, you know, like boiling of water as, you know, as, as science per se. So I think we need to start at the basic, you know, education level and educate um, the public on science. That's great. 
I just learned you have to give people coffee and they wake up. There's a lot of questions. So I think, speaking of coffee, David Buds Peterson has been awake now for 48 hours. Just so you know. <laughs> so David, we let you plow through the last, yeah. the last group. You don't mind. That's a good idea. Go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you for all those comments as well. I'm taking uh, vigorously notes here. There was a lot of really, really um, precise and, and useful comments being made, so that's very appreciated. Um, also, in terms of the of the industry academia relation and uh, the need for openness and the need to to make uh, results more widely available, these are very very um, important notes. So we we take them on board. What I wanted to do now is to to sort of just before we run out of time to get you through the last two sections um, of the principles, and then I, I hope Aiden can sort of uh, uh, round it, uh, wrap it up, and and get your final comments also to to these sections. So section four is about what we should expect from from I guess um, um, sort of uh, the different audiences and stakeholders in science, um, and they are indeed very different. And I also um, appreciate the, the remark that was made now that we might separate these things more more thoroughly in the final document so not to conflate um, the interest of the public with the interest of industry because they are indeed very different. Um, principle 14 says that um, the public needs to play a critical role in influencing uh, policy and must have a clear voice um, that science should be informing decisions uh, when, when when science is informing decisions affecting their communities. So whenever affected communities are um, are um, um, uh, relevant, they should be they should be listened to and included. So so really, the voice of the public needs to be strengthened. This has also been mentioned already several times in our discussion. Unless scientists and policymakers understand the principle, nothing for us without us, social outcomes will not be truly legitimate or balanced, but will more or less be uh, made in the laboratory and based on, um, on, the, on the knowledge and thinking only of scientists rather than on this sort of multi-stakeholder dialogue uh, that we are promoting. Um, then to industry, principle 15, the industry should acknowledge the importance of science for social justice and integrate it in their own R&D programs. Industry often is perceived as suffering from fatal conflicts of interests and its transformative powers often and in my own opinion uh, with some good reasons uh, dismissed. Um, in fact, commercial conflicts of interest are, uh, on the other hand, fairly easy to, easy to identify and even deal with um, if they are probably uh, declared. And again, here holds the principle of transparency. Industry is the cornerstone of, of progress and needs to be uh, included um, and also aware of its own influence and responsibility. So really, principle 15 is a call for leadership um, and, and for taking more responsibility for social justice in industry. Uh, principle 16 again goes back to citizen groups um, and acknowledges the fact that citizen groups have notable expertise that can also help inform and shape uh, social justice policies. Um, perhaps citizens in, in, in certain situations are even better equipped and have more uh, contextual knowledge than scientists um, and researchers. So they really need to have not only a strong voice, but there also needs to be, again, robust institutional structures for them to be included. Um, principle uh, 17, uh, democracy itself depends upon hearing the voices of all citizens, including those marginalized and without a voice. So many individuals and vulnerable groups do not have access to institutions or what we could call official channels of communication. But uh, democracy depends not only on majority rule, but on the empowerment and platform of also marginalized minorities. This is easily forgotten, but is of course a cornerstone of uh, science for social justice. Again, nothing here to be conflated with industry um, or media for that uh, matter. 
I will, I will, I will uh, uh, with with reference to the to the uh, time, uh, go through section five as well. I'm sure you you will have comments to section four. It is indeed a very crucial component of the declaration. Uh, but let me go through the last three principles. What needs to change? How scientific advice and greater focus on social justice need to be integrated more effectively. Last section. Principle 18, uh, scientific uh, research should be incentivized um, and organized uh, to address pertinent issues of social justice. So here we are looking at funding, incentives, rewards, uh, and also, as the colleague just mentioned a, a moment ago, actually making it mandatory to go through um, science communication courses or implementation science um, uh, skills while taking, uh, uh, for example, a, a PhD degree or, or equivalent. So, so, so these issues are pertinent to address and also to deliver uh, high quality and transparent advice to, to, to policymakers, uh, in particular policies for social justice. As it is currently organized, we state in the declaration, the science system produces significant but often narrowly focused, fragmented and compartmentalized knowledge that runs the risk of being disconnected from society's most intimate needs. So here again, we return to, to, um, to, the, to the topic of science communication, knowledge exchange, knowledge translation, citizen engagement and, and the likes. Very much uh, reiterating what the colleagues have mentioned this afternoon. Um, second to, to final uh, principle here, um, 19, policymakers must learn to include input from all disciplines and stakeholders when improving uh, rights and social justice. So again, the principle of diversity uh, is, is important. Uh, decision makers' mental models, so how they think about uh, the world, they truly matters. Um, if decision makers uh, have the opinion that citizens are incapable or even prone to panic, they will downplay engagement and transparency, as we saw in, uh, in some situations during uh, the pandemic. On the other hand, if decision makers think of citizens as ignorant, they will downplay complexities and uncertainties. So what we propose here is that uh, decision makers need to trust um, uh, citizens to make good decisions for themselves, that the citizens in the end of the day are the most important stakeholders in their own lives and in their own decisions about health. Um, uh, behavior attitudes. So we shouldn't downplay uh, their ability to act, but uh, on the other hand, encourage, empower, and build uh, literacy, as was also mentioned a moment ago. And then finally, um, in uh, in this uh, quite heavy uh, slide deck, um, uh, and the apologies for that, uh, principle 20, unleashing science to address and improve social justice issues will require pro, uh, proactive uh, priority setting and funding, uh, plus the creation of research missions for social justice with a special attention on health harm reduction and climate justice. So um, ecological uh, justice, um, uh, intellectual justice and social justice as well. The scale of the challenges organizations should come together to prioritize a new set of scientific missions to support the attainment of greater social justice for all. So this again is really a call for action among uh, science policy makers, funders, um, university leaders, and uh, community leaders uh, within and beyond the academic community. So uh, thank you uh, for having uh, having had the patience to go through all of these 20 principles. Now uh, I will leave the word to um, to Aidan. Just David, before you run, we'll give you the last word. So now you've read them out, and it's probably the first time you have. What do you think is completely missing? Or at the coffee break, people were telling me that they find it's a very global north approach, and um, it should be workshopped out, maybe splitting the the. The, the stakeholders into different well, groups, like bringing together yeah, the industry. I mean, yes. 
and the journalists separately? Well, that can be done. I, I must say that uh, when redrafting the Trinity Principles together with uh, Michel Kasatsky uh, prior to today's workshop and having worked intensively on the document last week, we did take on board a lot of good comments from prior consultation events, including our uh, essential event on uh, in December in Cape Town, um, and also taking into consideration the 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 all the comments being submitted by 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 colleagues last year. So I think the document has already benefited from from some more nuances. But again, Aiden, I don't know if that was a leading question. I guess I'm not really the the right person to answer that question. I think the document is still open. And um, as you can guess um, in the room this afternoon, um, what we are really looking for is, is, is specific comments on text, wordings, um, also, of course, what is missing, but rather than rewriting entire entire sections, I think it, it would be very valuable, as everybody has signed up for today and, and, and really also exercised, to, to provide us with these more text-specific text comments. They are uh, tremendously helpful uh, for finalization. Then what, what perhaps what could be emphasized more was something mentioned by a colleague earlier today, uh, coalitions, partnerships, uh, here in the last principle, we talk about missions. Missions are another word for, for societal partnerships, but perhaps coalitions, partnerships, alliances um, are missing uh, across these different institutions that we all deem uh, important to include uh, when promoting science for social justice. Um, so perhaps something on, on global partnerships or, or also local partnerships. And, uh, and again, Aiden, as you know, uh, we received comments also in the consultation about emphasizing harm reduction even more than we are doing. So like really bringing uh, scientific evidence, solutions, diagnostics, medicines um, to the most affected communities. This could perhaps be strengthened more instead of talking about, let's say, incentives or funding programs for, for scientists. No matter how important th they are, we also need to, to, to sort of give attention to the real nuts and bolts of bringing science to bear on uh, the real lives of real citizens. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, David. You can sleep now. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so that much. That will not take me off. So we have about 35, 40 minutes left before we're offered a fantastic reception by Science Diplomacy Capital for Africa. I won't spoil the party, but we have a fairly big announcement to give tonight. So if you're staying for the dinner, stay just for that, because if you're not there, you can't say you're one of the first people in the world to hear it. So we have a nice announcement, don't we? Sorry? We have a nice announcement to give later. Oh, absolutely, yes. We have a good deal. <laughs> so what... What David is getting at is that I stood away from this document because I'm involved in the organization. I don't get involved in the outcomes or content, but I come in at the end and feed back in because everyone cancels each other out. So what you have to see is when the documents come in, people see what people are submitting, and then they try to scratch that idea or scratch that idea, usually via the back door or whatever. So, you know, some people are quite angry about one in 10 kids in Africa are still dying before the age of five and vaccines and stuff like this. So we do put back in anecdotes and um, give you some examples. Um, the new nature editor in chief when she started, Magdalena Skipper, she said that there could be no article or press release from nature ever again without at least two female citations or quotes and so on. But this doesn't happen in science. So when, when Ebola breaks out in Africa, it's the tropical diseases white guy from London who's on all the news, who's never even seen it. So the calling out of stuff and just checking, and in Europe, for example, at the European Union and in most governments, we have very strong rebuttal systems. So I was struck, I, I put in a complaint to the BBC here when their correspondent during COVID was showing footage of rats eating blood outside hospitals. That's over-reporting, you get sacked for that. You know what I'm saying? So those are the kind of things we'll feed back in between the lines, but we need five or 10 new ideas for the document. And it's usually too obvious to mention stuff. So if you could help focus on that, like um, people all want to talk about organized intelligence, artificial intelligence, you know, uh, gender reassignment, you know, euthanasia, designer babies, all that comes in, but we kind of move away from that. We want the most basic examples possible of what's the right thing to do as we go through this. 
But I like the idea of taking industry aside and doing a few specific um, principles on them. Most people resist it. They do not like that industry has their word to say, especially when the industry people are top scientists, leading innovation people. Um, for example, in the EU right now, we know that Britain is moving completely into kind of dodgy science because there's lots of money in it, so they can escape the ethical framework of the Horizon program and stuff. But behind the scenes, in Brussels, they say, we're so happy. Somebody can do it, not just the Chinese. So all these systems come into play, outsourcing, insourcing, what we share and what we don't share. So if we could take the last half hour, just for, go for it on um, what's really crap about the document, what is, is there anything you haven't heard before, anything you'd like to add? Himmler had a great idea at the coffee break that should break, force people to come together per sector, get the industry people in, in, in a workshop, get the journalists in a workshop, get the policymakers in a workshop, and test the document with them and then bring it together again. Otherwise, it might not work properly, you know. Did you want to say anything on that, Himmler? Yes, no, thank you very much. Firstly, I just want to make a general comment about the document. Yeah. I think this document serves as a good basis uh, for uh, insights no matter where in the world you sit. Mm. And I think that was the intention of the Cape Town Declaration, mm. was for us to have a document that would speak to any person anywhere in the world. Mm. Having said that, the way the sections are crafted are good for us to take, uh, uh, use this as an opportunity to, to, to check what the sectorial responsibilities are and to what extent they're contributing to the narrative of social justice and equity. Mm -hmm. um, from an academy perspective, I will um, kind of try to workshop the various themes ESOF is planning, and we will take this to council in a week and a half's time, to have an annual general meeting for the members. And I have just edited the draft document, and I'm putting this topic on for discussion. Excellent. So I will try to workshop that with as many ASAF members that we have. Uh, the other point is that where we sit in South Africa, we are constantly challenged with many uh, globally related challenges, but that affect us differentially. I think some of the comments that have come from the House up until now kind of reflects that. That yes, we have good mechanisms in place to set up discussions, to uh, put policy into, into place, but we do lack the resonance in terms of the implementation. And part of that is Unlike some of our European counterparts, in South Africa, redress is a very important activity in our uh, society in building the new South Africa we all desire. And we just can't throw those aspects away. The issues of the triple burden of disease, you know, poverty, inequalities, and uh, inequity is also part and parcel of our psyche. So, so redress features in many, many ways. Uh, but at the same time, we need to be able to marry and align it in terms of the science that we do. We've discussed several times the kind of uh, mistrust that we have with the public. Uh, Mandy talked about the publics and you know, the responsibilities we have. And I think some other colleague mentioned some of the difficulties you have in trying to steer away from your commitment of deliverables to funds that you receive to do particular types of projects and then having to stand in the same line uh, to, to defend your community engagement, citizen science, and the likes of taking science from the ivory towers into the communities. And I think we, we, we are all trying to do this, but we, we can't do it to the extent that we would all love to do it. I mean, I know from an academy perspective, we're currently on roadshows to the former HDIs, et cetera, and it comes at huge expense and time, et cetera, uh, but it is something that we have to do because that's our commitment of bringing um, science into the public domains 
outside of the big five universities and areas that we have a lot of presence for. So, so I think, uh, just to conclude, Chair, that the document gives us a very good um, primer onto which all of us present from the different sectors can take it forward. And I think we should challenge us, ourselves, to use this document when finalized to say, well, how many of the recommendations included in here have we addressed? Mm -hmm. We can't do all, granted, because we all come into the pot from different uh, fronts and, 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 and portfolios. But even if we could say, well, you know what, I did this one to the best of my ability. And then when we put the sum of the parts together, I think we would have a better base to say, well, we have uh, committed ourselves to using the recommendations in this document to, to take social justice for the benefit of one and all uh, in our journeys ahead. So from wearing my cap as a, a member of the academy and also the, C, uh, the executive officer, we will do our bit from the academy to, to try to raise the bar and the profile of engagement at all of the sectors that are in the document and at some point try to bring it together. And maybe we could do it jointly with you again yeah. uh, in a couple of years' time or uh, uh, give us some time to work on it and, and then come back and uh, you know, have a review. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. So you know me, I, the brain works fast. So I, when I get an offer, I have to take it and think about it. So my problem with that would be, I, I might be mistaken, but 55 countries in Africa, only 18 academies, right? No, we have 28 together. 28, so like yeah. that's half, more or less, okay? Yeah. All those small island nations all over the world with no academies, no experts, so what could we do to get beyond that in sense of, like, could we create a global social justice academy? Um, think about it, the Global Development Academy, why is it in Trieste in Italy? Yeah, Plus, but, why, but why again, isn't it we, in, need in Africa? Be, we need to be, take cognizance of the fact mm. that we do have established uh, national academies, yeah. And we also have young academies. And rather than creating another portal, what we need to do yeah. is bring this topic into the conversation. So for example, this year the meeting of academies on the African continent is taking place at uh, the end of November yeah. in Morocco. So perhaps we should, yeah. we should write to the executive of uh, um, uh, NASAC, including the, the secretary, Jackie, and, and say to her, we've been having this discussion, and perhaps let's have a little discussion here yeah. to set the conversation going. And, and this way, we have we'll now pull in at least 28 countries. Brilliant. There are lots of things going on in, on the African continent that, that we don't really address. The, the issues in Sudan and, and elsewhere, yeah. those are all part and parcel of this brief. Yeah. So we need to use existing portals rather than creating new ones. Yeah. Otherwise, we, be we become over-commissioned in terms yeah. of where we can act. So, so I think taking the conversation further, that that may be the next level of, of address. And then there are other portals like Asterisk, et cetera, that we can try to address. And of course, we are fortunate that with uh, the Department of Science and Innovation, that we have uh, done in the international yeah. office who can also help us establish those linkages with the international partners on the African continent. So, so let's use the portals and mechanisms in existence to get the word yeah. out and then see where we can take it. Starting a new one is, in my opinion, going to be like trying to double dip and, and um, you know, it, it just like tributaries the, the, mm. the mainstream river into many portals and you get no action. Well, without preempting, I think tomorrow night we have from Science Diplomacy Capital a, a pledging evening where lots of groups internationally have come up with social justice pledges. So let's hear what, what comes out of that. But I mean, for example, the International Labour Organization has just announced a new executive post for social justice. Some newspaper, TV and radio stations are creating a whole new beat called social justice where, you know, certain things like epidemiology only started 30 years ago. It takes time, but we're pushing all those kind of little buttons at the same time. And you'll see that in the final document. There's a long list of 
ideas. But sometimes it's a bit like revenge porn. People only want to get their pound of flesh back. So we have to be a bit careful on just taking stuff from the global north, planting it in the global south, and thinking that it's job done. But I do, I do respect that um, the academies in Europe are so different. In Denmark, where, where David's from, Carlsberg is the biggest funder of, of kind of social justice, and it's a brewery. There's no way in hell some other member states would allow them in the door even in a meeting. So it's kind of very strange. But most academies in Europe are particularly retirement homes for old scientists and an awards <laughs> program with medals and titles. So there again, it's important to have them in, but um, we need the grassroots somehow to come through all of this. And that's probably the challenge, Imla, I would put back. Any more comments, please? Yes, this gentleman. Go ahead. Thank you, and thank you for that. I'm Pradeep Kumar from British University. I'm a lab scientist, bench researcher. So in my opinion, so I was going through the document, and in section number five, point number five, is very diluted in my opinion. So it says the integrity of science is central, that's it. But I think and data is very important as well. Science and data, as well as the quality and reliability only. But what about accessibility and reproducibility? Okay. So these are the very essential uh, components that are, so these days you can see AI and fourth revolution or fourth industrial revolution is coming as you mentioned and we are keeping it away. But the data is producing is, is real. And, mm. and who is producing the data and at, to what extent and what ethics are involved in the data production and keeping it safe. So these yeah. few things that I would like to, to, to mention. Well, I'm from the Republic of Ireland. We keep 80% of the world's data but we don't call it data espionage technologies, but it is there. Mm -hmm. But your point is just basic scientific sharing of data, research results. What level of data are you talking about? So even public health data, not only uh, lab research data. So lab research data, if you publish in publications, and there's always a section you can put supplementary data in there, but public health data is, is not actually accessible to all. And it should be uh, not accessible in, in terms of, so if I am in, 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 at which medical school, so do I have access to data with, okay, there are ethics involved, but, but to, if a scientists have produced the data or they have, so we can see in a different way and process it differently and, and get di different results. For the medical doctors here, I mean, I saw for tomorrow's slides, um, only 16 out of 55 African countries even report data on harm reduction. Like, where's the anger about that kind of, I mean, I don't know, but... W where, where, why aren't people asking for that data, looking for it? I mean, how can you do medicine if you don't have that data, this kind of data? I mean, are, are the problems so obvious and staring us in the face that we should, we, we're just not starting with the too obvious to mention? Yeah. Adrian, some of the provocative questions you've been asking um, are, are difficult to address um, with this document. I think one of the things you've been asking is about counteracting some of the actions of the global powers. Mm. Um, and I, I don't necessarily think that for, from where I stand in our context, this document is going to level the playing field in terms mm. of the asymmetries of power, including the examples that you've been given in terms of the tactics that are used to sort of uh, make sure that people in the global north or the the powerful countries push their own agendas. Mm. So what I think this can do for us, and I think it will be over ambitious to think that we can use this document to level the playing field um, as South Africa or as Africa. But I think what it can do um, is, as colleagues have said, allow us to reflect on these issues and to engage in conversations and begin to ask some of the difficult questions, especially in our context. And I feel like charity begins at home. It's important to address these things here before we even think about how to tackle, you know, um, European countries or European powers or American powers on, on related issues. That's my, that's my first point. I think that needs to be done, but I feel like maybe it's a different conversation to the way that I'm thinking about this document in front of us. Yeah. The second point you, you are raising in terms of you know, the, the need for, for anger and, and, and reaction to the injustice that are there. I think that 
you know, we in South Africa are tired. Yeah. You know, we are drained. We are exhausted. And I think that it's, it's a little bit, at times I feel like it's a little bit unreasonable to expect people who are overwhelmed with the day-to-day -day challenges every day of what they see in front, in front of them to continue to maintain that, that level of anger. And I agree, it's not something that should go away. We should keep the pressure. But the problem that we have is that we don't know who knows what. We don't know who's part of what. Even the trust is, is difficult to know who to trust because yeah. right now I might be having a conversation with you being angry about the numbers that you're talking about, but you probably know more about how those numbers came about or what's driving them than I do. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it becomes difficult to even trust and engage in those conversations. That's why people need safe spaces mm. to be able to engage. And I think it's important to sort of allow and, and respect the, the need for those safe spaces for people to, to get angry and, 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 and lash out about the things that they're frustrated about. But if anything can come out of this or should come, come out of this, it's a point that you've reflected on also at the beginning around accountability. But you know, you've made it subtle. I saw you put it under nine, but it's not the title of that, of that point. You know, the title of the point is about respect for a role of expertise and, and evidence. But we know expertise and evidence and scientific debate, all of those things happen in closed doors. Mm. We try and look at the consensus statements. ASAF does that, the academies, they do that. We try and look at the weight of the evidence. There's all that that needs to happen, but really, that point about accountability of the decision makers is something that's really important because yeah. it requires the transparency that we need in order to promote trust. Yeah. And, and you can say the same in terms of the industry, but the point you made about it's, it's a diplomacy world. People will say one thing and mean another and go and do something completely different. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we therefore have to ask ourselves whether as a doctor, for example, or a scientist, this is the best use of my time to be engaging in conversations where, you know, a, a rug is constantly yeah. pulled under your feet and a curtain is pulled, or wool is pulled over your eyes. So I, I do think that for, from where I'm sitting, let's use this document to be able to stimulate those active and productive conversations that can lead yeah. to, to action, especially in, 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 in the context that we're in. So if you read the Brussels Declaration from 2017, it's all about accountability. And there, it was extremely hard hitting on policymakers. So we tried to not just replicate it. But I agree with you, we've been, I've been trying very hard to keep out the negativity and keep things on the positive and realism. Of course, we're not gonna change the world, but small, I do believe that one person or one good idea does change a lot. I give the example with NIH, changing the training for all doctors. But give you an example of some of the proposals that have come through already. One of the science advisors in Europe said that um, he would like to see all scientists in certain sectors take an oath like doctors do to uphold social justice in their work. You know, these small things, little things, it sounds silly, but it, it has an impact on the system per se. Um, you get a lot of resource-driven questions about the money, um, who works for who. Even um, the Nigerians, if you, if you move to the UK now for more than two years, as a doctor and then start working for the private sector, you have to repay all your medical training fees, things like this. So there's stuff coming through, but what I've seen as well, very clever stuff is like Naledi Pandor and the DG, they were in Toulouse in 2018. I could see she was getting physically mad that every question was about Ebola, Ebola, Ebola. And she just said, look, you live closer to Ebola in Toulouse than I do in South Africa. And then she, she got mad again because um, we were talking about climate change, whole panels on climate change. But when DG Phil informed the room that it would be 7% in sub-Saharan Africa, but nobody in the room, even from the climatologists, would believe this because where did they get that report from? You know this mentality. So I believe that good reports, you can have quotas for the experts, who the experts are, who gets to travel, who gets to the conferences. And you can see even in the UNESCO system, you guys have 55 votes. You can decide who gets the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth job every day of the week. That's what the EU does. 
So it's just small things about bringing the justice through different mechanisms. But I totally take your point. We can't go off piste and think we're going to solve every problem in science through a 20-page document or a 20-principle document. But you'll all get this back, so you'll have a chance to... I'll count on you to come back in with some good text. Yes, Mamamuchi. There's something missing. Yes. In this uh, draft. There, there is now, you know, we are now moving. Speak into that. Yeah. yeah. We, we, have, we have moved now from the first, second, third industrial revolution. We are now moving into the fourth and fifth industrial revolution. Mm. The digital economy, digital agriculture, mm. smart farms, blockchain. blockchain, Internet of Things all 3D printing, all these things are happening. Mostly now, this is also creating uh, challenges. Job creation and job loss are also happening. So in, when we say industry, I think we should address machine learning, all these things, Internet of Things, all these things must be included. In what way is this changing? Mm -hmm. The laboratory. I was recently in the universities in China, and I was telling them how they can also link with the universities in South Africa and the rest of Africa. I think they are now uh, giving us some grants. And what we want to work on is on laboratories, even on, on how to also uh, the digital aspect in la lab. All these things have to be actually ad addressed also, so that the science can change. So is there any chance that on this area we also frame some of these things? Uh, it's very, very important. And in, in China now, the rural area is changing because there are smart farms, digital farming is happening, uh, digital agriculture, agro entrepreneurs are being created, mm. and things like that. And we are, we are, we're also trying to do a study, case studies from China and case studies from South Africa. We also are getting funding. For, for this kind of partnerships. Things like that are what we're working on. Uh, we want to learn something. We don't want to copy China, but we want to learn what are the things they are doing so that our own farmers also learn. The other thing is we have this RISA project, Re uh, Research Innovation System in Africa. The British government, the council gave us about 550,000 pounds, and we are working on, systematically we are working, on how we can change farmers to farm differently. We are, in fact, uh, we had a conference where farmers spent time with us. I was so fascinated, learning from them. No, no, sincerely, it's fascinating. I mean, the, instead of talking about it, link them, actually work with them, and we're spending two days, and all of them saying that they are going to do farming in a different way, not in the way they were farming with animals and things. I think even having this kind of change in Africa is fascinating. Is there any chance we do practical things and practical efforts? And something like that is what I suggest. Let's no, please I'm, add, I'm, but add this element also. We will, we will add please. the anecdotes, but we, we also are careful with them. I mean, the EU is just lifting the ban on Japanese exports of food. At the same time, they're putting the water into the sea after Fukushima. There's, there's examples we have already of um, when the Biden administration banned all fruit and veg imports from Mexico. Every minister in Latin America and Caribbean got together to ask for the evidence of this science through UNESCO. So you can't get away with it as much as you used to in fiddling the system. But I'm just a bit concerned if we get into fourth industrial revolution. I mean, the CSIR is doing amazing stuff. They would have position papers on this, lots of things. But I do think science in social injustice and scientific injustice through tech is a big point. It definitely should come into some of the principles. But getting into details might be a bit tricky. But I do agree with you completely. Maybe the digital side could actually correct the moral injustice, the lack of moral intelligence. As a solution to the it social might help injustice. Us also, because yeah. some of the things we make mistakes, we, it can detect it. So it can, it can be regulated digitally, which would be very good. Mm -hmm. This way, then human beings, their mistakes, their lies, their cheating, everything can be also controlled. What do yeah. you think? <laughs> Students with visas. <laughs> Any more comments? So you, we will definitely look at, we, got a little bit of time. we definitely look at shifting things around. This comes from a lot of academics and kind of end of career UN people 
who at the same time mightn't have the courage of their convictions to really spell it out. Tomorrow we have a lot of activists, activists coming to the conference and you'll see in the sessions the real nuts and bolts of social injustice will come through and we will look at that too and take up examples. But um, the question is then how do we get it out, how do we get people to know about it. We definitely do a lot of work around Science Forum South Africa this December. But um, what I find as well is people get lazy with their networks. It's very easy to add something to a newsletter or your email groups and stuff. And the more you do it, the more the, the news comes out. But um, we, we haven't decided how to package it yet. Because when we did this in 2012, 2017, the world was different. It was done through paper still. So we do want the youth activists to get involved. We do want TikTok and, and LinkedIn. You know, we want to do this in a different way. But um, it could be a living document as well that gets more, more revised, like Himmler said, can be improved time and time again. But um, I didn't see this until today either. So I'm seeing this like you. And I can see also myself, lots of stuff has been left out. So I can see some of the games maybe. But um, the voice, what's, what's interesting for me is the voice of Africa is seldom heard, even when you consult Africans. Maybe it's an insulting term. But what Naledi set us the, char the task in 2017 was to come up with a document that was showing some pan-African thinking at the solu for solutions-based science. It wasn't that we were going to do a Cape Town declaration on Africa. So it's a global document. But I still have not found a lot of um, interesting, juicy stuff coming through. So that would be my challenge to everyone to still help. Um, for, example, for example, Sully, there's this health initiative coming out of Morocco. There's things coming out of the African Union all the time. Like, to what degree do we involve other actors at this stage, or should we keep it very refined? I mean, I'm a bit concerned that the minute something gets out with my name on it or Dan Detois' name, you start getting hit with hundreds of requests from industry, from governments and stuff. Um, so I'm a little bit in two minds what I should do. I mean, what would be, you've been involved since the start. Maybe you could help with a few kind of closing words. Where, you know the South African system, you know Africa, and you know what we've been doing. So what would you think? Yeah, I think this is not a once-off issue. It's a follow-up of mm. previous meetings. So we keep it, you know, as it is, South African, but leading to linkages with other declarations within the World Science Forum. There are new developments, yes. Uh, the Africa Global Health, which came up with a charter last year in, in Marrakesh, in Morocco. That, that's a new development. It will have its momentum. But there will be a synergy at a later stage, you know. And uh, I think, as also discussed by Himmler, they still need to workshop this you know, yeah. in the academy and then also make some uh, amendments and, and get you know, the people involved more familiar with, 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 this, uh, with these points of consideration here. I think that, that's very helpful. But we can't open it too much now because it's linked to previous things mm -hmm. and it adds into the ongoing developments within the World Science Forum. And, and then the, the challenge to everybody would be to think of another th topic or theme that we would do across five more years as, as a next study that could be led out of Africa as well. That's we haven't even begun to think about. Can I just ask a question? Uh, was there no timeline in terms of finalization of this document? There was. It was that we were, Naledi, uh, we were going to present in 2021. But then the World Science Forum got cancelled by one year because of COVID, so we extended. But we continued with Himmler's support to keep doing panels through remote panels online. Like we had one panel with Himmler, like no joking, and Francois was on it. We had like 1,300 full views on, on the internet. Like it's much better than we get at the conference. So we were realizing by through COVID that we were having far more outreach on these topics and groups watching it and commenting. So. I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm quite optimistic that the impact can be much stronger, thanks to what we've learned with the academy through COVID and things. You know, so I would be quite optimistic. But the wording has to be good because, you know, people try to destroy you. You know, you'll get an editor in the Lancet who tries to take it apart because it's not their idea. So you will get groups who come after it and the wording and stuff. But what we try to do is everybody who's been involved, we kind of put them on the list and we ask them, are you okay? People change jobs. But what happens is when a declaration comes out, groups 
who are really supportive. They try to back off it and make it look like they were never there, which is a bit sad as well. So we lose some people who, who don't want to be associated when it gets big. You know? And I'm afraid to give it back to Naledi Pandor after five years. God knows what she'll do with it if I ask her to, to give some comments. But the policy guys, that's the surprising thing. The science advisors crowd and the, the, the policy people, they come in with a very refreshing look as well, and they often give you a, a few ideas that really pulls it together. So we will go back to people, but um, it's a work in progress. So I think we should, um, we all deserve a glass of wine on the deck, Nuzimo. I think, I think that's where we are. Is it on the deck? For the reception, it's on the deck, is it? From what, 5.30? Yeah. yeah, there's a question. Brilliant. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair. I'm Deboho from the Academy of Science of South Africa. Um, just adding on what uh, Prof. Sudial was saying, that the document can be circulated to the different um, teams, depending on yeah. the theme. I'm just wondering who's the public uh, in Section 4? Who, who, who do we classify as the public? And was the public part of uh, this group that... Yeah, it's a uh, great, great question. So <laughs> the public is often interest groups who are involved in a specific theme. So, for example, in one panel in Copenhagen, where we had, um, I think it's Imran Patal, the name correct? Yeah, Imran. We brought in a mother whose um, son had just died from an overdose that week to talk about her battle in, in trying to keep him in and out of care and all that stuff. So we do go after specific groups. But of course, we're not out there at a rock concert talking to the public per se. But when it goes out to the journalists and they write about it, we get a lot of comments back. And it's very open access. People write in a lot of comments. But the public is generally the interest groups, third parties, charity sector, people working with scientists, people who have an interest in science, um, a lot of uh, individuals who run journals, academics. So it's a broad community, but how would you suggest we get at the public? Um, that's the challenge, uh, because South Africa, the demographics of South mm. Africa is very unique. Um, I do understand that um, in some communities you would have uh, those kind of interest groups and you would have um, very vibrant um, communities and whatnot. But what about that community where even on the radio they don't hear anything about science? My grandmother, um, I mean, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, how does then science get to her um, if there are no... Um, those kind of resources are not available in that community, and yet it is the very same community that this document um, is, 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 is gearing to, uh, towards. Um, and I think one of the uh, comments that was made, um, I can't remember by who, but when you go to the public, the very same public where we use samples from those uh, uh, communities for our research and all that. Couldn't then it be that when we are done, we keep the circle moving yeah. around so that um, once we are done, it's not just a full stop, but we come back and we feedback them and we keep the wheel uh, going. I think in that manner, then we keep that community um, clued up and, and, and in, in, inside the circle at all times. Um, I think that's uh, one of the ways, instead of just sampling, going to our labs and getting the results and they don't even know um, what you are doing with their samples and even after that, um, you find that there's even a policy, a new policy based on that study that they don't even know about that, you know, that kind of knowledge can also assist um, us in terms of going to the communities because now uh, since COVID that there's a whole lot of um, mistrust that has happened because now for, for instance we were hit with COVID and um, there were in certain instances where communities now never even trusted the science that 
um, should be helping them because now things are not communicated timelessly. I think someone was talking about um, these things that we do, we need to do them timelessly, but sometimes um, those kind of things were not communicated timelessly, and then someone here say, say something to that, same, and then the whole community gets the wrong information, and then when the right information comes, it's no longer uh, taken as... as, as um, uh, so, so I think it's a two-pronged approach we have. I mean, yeah. we, wouldn't everybody want to believe that every family in every village in the world is going to sit down and read a declaration written by us? It's not going to happen. We're trying to influence the gatekeepers in the system, global systems, national systems, and local systems, to actually you know, be held accountable, as was said, for making bad decisions to keep people out, marginalized. You know, I know when your government goes to, on a trade mission to America, they have the data on how many um, black graduates get into university, whether it's in Italy or Belgium or France, and you look and you'll see why did the gold medalist in mathematics from Stellenbosch not get that position in Sheffield University? And you can ask these legitimate questions. It's just by putting pressure and empowering people to ask questions. To your other point about youth, we've had very difficult panels here over the last seven years where a room like this and rooms like this with Himla, the youth put up their hand and they proposed that as a social justice measure, any professor in the country over 50 should give up their job and give it to a young person. And, you know, sounds wonderful, but it's not going to work. So we get a lot of that too. But I do agree with you that the traction has to come that young people feel the power to hold the system to account. And, you know, it's still in the world of science more than any other world. It's often who you know, not what you know, sadly. So we, we will be able to benchmark progress on mobility, but also you, you, you want to see different faces presenting. Um, I've seen so many panels on topics where it's on a medical issue and not one person on the panel is even a doctor. The problem is the government agencies don't want to invite doctors from hospitals in on the panel to talk about that topic. So the community has to say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to that conference if it's not going to be a doctor who's operating tomorrow on that topic. So there's very easy mechanisms to to hold bureaucrats to account on these kinds of things. But um, also the, the, the G7, G20 stuff is very important because, you know, the BRICs are coming here. Um, the politics determines everything. Scientists can have opinions and scientists can have great intentions, but everything we're talking about is set by governments who make laws based on national interests and it's convincing them to allow it to be a bit more global. That's the trick. You know, we all see from Europe that every sick president in Europe comes to South Africa for an operation. Why is your former president gone to Russia for one? You know, people ask this question, what's wrong with the South African medical system? You know, so from, you have to look from externally and internally. But I think we can come up with a very few small points. In 2012, we came up with an expression that now everyone says, we invented the concept of evidence-based policymaking versus policy-biased evidence-making. And for a lot of people, that just suddenly made sense. We came up with the idea, I told you in this, of like institutionalized manslaughter, looking back in anger at bad decisions made in public health and stuff like that. And people didn't like that, but then you see it does change. So we're, we're looking for new language, uh, new ideas. All we need is maybe two or three shiny new ideas in the declaration and it will fly. We're not trying to solve everything. But I like your question because the woman in that village should have the right to be able to read and understand a document that is written in a language that can be understood and is in basic language. So we've also tried to make it less scientific and I know people are right when they say you're missing a word here and what type of good, public good. But like, let's be realistic. Um, when we were inviting people for this conference with the help of DSI and Science Diplomacy Capital for Europe, about 80% of people wrote back going, what does harm reduction mean? Never heard of it. And think about that, you know? So it's, 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 it's a struggle. But, um, but what we're doing is fighting the good fight through the gatekeepers and the institutions and uh, especially at the EU level, interfacing. Um, in the very first meeting, and this is, I'll leave you with this thought, the Americans thought that everyone in the EU shared data. And the director of NIH who came over for the first meeting, he explained to us what they do secretly in America is at Christmas they pick three states out of 50 and they allow you to take the blood from people for alcohol testing. And then they pass a bill really quickly that you can test that blood for drug use. And then they'll get a national 
comparison and they're able to look at what's happening with the population. So the population don't even know their blood is being looked at, right? But they just presume that we would be doing this all the time in the EU, like that, you know? So you'd be surprised when you put people together in the same room from the same profession, working for decades together, how they don't even communicate the most basic stuff. So that's what we're trying to do, is put people together. It's not just about today in a document. It's about getting some passion going inside South Africa to feel proud again to support science. We get all the negativity all the time, like you said. But that exists everywhere. But I do find, and I, I said this, I think, th this morning to somebody, coming from the Republic of Ireland where I grew up with a civil war, per se, once it was over in 1997, we didn't even have a truth and reconciliation, but we didn't look back, right? But I do find in, in Africa, people are picking the scab of, of problems. It, if one of the conferences, we had two ministers in Auckland, and on the panel, they were having like a, a pity fuck argument, which country was the poorest, and they were, how many twirly birds roads do you have? How many luggage carousels do you have at your national airport? Trying to show the West that one country was poorer than the other. And that's one of the reasons we started these kinds of initiatives, because we want to empower people to be positive. The document is supposed to be positive. So I would say this to everyone, and I'll leave you with that. Social justice doesn't mean only social injustice. It's also about sharing positivity and things that work. And that's what we're trying to do. But very often, it boils down to the negative, you know? And that's human nature. So the most unscientific thing of all is human nature, right? You can spend 20 billion telling people to stop smoking, it'll kill them, but they'll still smoke. It's how you nudge them to do things one way or another. So what we're trying to do is nudge the policymakers, per se. And maybe, who knows, maybe in, in five years' time, thanks to the science diplomacy capital, if we work with them, they might have social justice emissaries here at the embassies of all the countries. It could become a theme for diplomacy. You don't know. But you have to dream to do that to change things, right? So that's what we're going to try and do. So do you want to say a last few words? Because you, you're our host. No, I just wanted to say that the um, networking cocktail in the dinner is going to be in the Ember Room, right. which is down the, um, the foyer, beyond the reception, on the other end of this building. Um, from 5.30, should be now, starting yeah. already. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to engagement with everyone who's present here uh, under the auspices of the SDCFA, um, but to also ensure that uh, we do have legacies that we all can be proud of yeah. um, beyond um, the World Science Forum and beyond these events that we're having. So we are, we are ready to engage on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, and tomorrow, don't forget tomorrow, we have very good speakers. We're opening with Salim Abdul Karim. And we finish with his, his wife, Karisha, of course. And in between, we have three or four foreign presentations. But tomorrow, we'll really be looking at public health. So if you're working in public health, today was a bit boring, I know. But tomorrow, you'll really see some cool stuff. So thank you all very much. And let's go and grab... Sorry, morning. sorry, Aidan. Before we all leave, I just want to say a very big thank you to you for taking us on this journey and bringing us to the point of where we could uh, engage with the document. I know you work very, very hard and very passionately <laughs> on this uh, project. And I think we, uh, from whichever portfolio we come from, are the better for your enthusiasm that you show in, in taking us on this journey. Uh, for people who don't know, I mean, Aidan may be Irish and he may be from the North, but he's really very passionate about advancing the interests of Africa and Africans across the continent. Um, I've been privileged to have engagements with you and we've shared very uh, many um, uh, engagements on the topic. Uh, and I just wanted, because I'm having, going to have to travel tomorrow, so I'm unfortunately not here, but my colleagues are present, uh, to just sincerely thank you for everything you. that you do to getting us on the platform and to giving us a, an opportunity for a voice. Yeah. And I think that's an immeasurable uh, impact that you contribute to South African science. So thank you very, very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
I just, I just hope that Himmel invites me back next year when we knock South Africa out of the Rugby World Cup. That's my only worry. Yes, Please get the gift. Oh, yeah. You deserve a gift. Oh, come on. It's good. Let's go. Let's go.